This week, we preempt our regularly scheduled broadcast of Quality Digest Live to bring you our inaugural virtual test and measurement expo. That's right. We'll be looking at some great technical demos, taking your questions with application engineers, and checking in on Manufacturing Day events. All that and more when we come back. Well, welcome back everyone to Quality Digest Virtual Test and Measurement Expo. I'm Mike Richmond, publisher of Quality Digest. And I'm Quality Digest Editor-in-Chief, Dirk Ducharme. Well, as Mike said, we're doing something really special today. Uh, in lieu of Quality Digest Live, we're presenting this special two-hour show packed mm -hmm. with information not only on test and measurement, but about, what about uh, what's going on in the state of manufacturing in the United States today. That's right, and what better to do that than right now, the first Friday in October, which is Manufacturing Day across the United That's States. Right. So let me set the stage for what we're bringing you here on our expo today. First and foremost, you're gonna see three great in-depth technical demos from our sponsors, the LS Starry Company and Faro Technologies. And uh, leading things off here in just a few moments will be Eric Perkins of Starrett, and he'll be demonstrating the company's L1 force measurement system. Eric will also be joining us via Skype to answer your questions, which by the way, if you have any questions anytime during the show, just send them to us. You can send them that QDL at qualitydigest.com. You can tweet them to us at Quality Digest or on YouTube or on the player page there, you should see a chat box and you can also chat to us. So send us questions anytime about any of the equipment that you're seeing and we'll get to them. That's right. Now, the second major segment on the show today comes to you from Farrow. Raphael Hasman and Mike Kosky are gonna show you their Quantum S scan arm. Uh, and then Raphael is gonna join us here in the studio live to take your questions as well. That's right, and for the final piece, we'll return to Starrett, this time with their Kinometric Engineering Division. And Greg Maish uh, of Starrett has an overview of their brand new Flip HVR100 video measurement system, which is really cool, and yep, guess what? Greg will also be here in the studio to answer your questions as well. So at any time, feel free, as I said, to send us uh, questions about the equipment that you're seeing, or maybe about Manufacturing Day if you want, and we'll try to answer them during the show. I'm repeating this again, qdl <laughs> at qualitydigest.com. You can email to that, tweet at qualitydigest, or you can use the chat feature. That's right. Now, during the breaks between these, these major segments, we're gonna be celebrating Manufacturing Day with interviews uh, from those on the front lines of industry. And then we're gonna wrap up with one big round table, or a half round table. Half round table, curve table, <laughs> <laughs> a discussion featuring all of our in-studio experts talking about the state of measurement and manufacturing today. Well, that's an ambitious agenda and we're already a couple minutes into it as I see on our clock. So without further ado, let's jump right into our first segment. This segment is brought to you by Starrett. Starrett now offers a full spectrum of solutions for strength and material measurement. Right, so for the next half hour or so, we're going to take a look at a handful of force testing equipment from Starrett. So if your company needs to understand either the tensile or compression characteristics of a material or even a finished product, then you already know the importance that this technology plays in understanding how much stress your product can withstand before breaking, for instance, or maybe how much force it takes to, I don't know, puncture the, the foil lid of a food product, or maybe you need to measure the, the frictional characteristics of an anti-skid coating. There's a lot of applications where force measurements are necessary. So joining us via Skype right now to talk about force testers is Eric Perkins of Starrett, joining us via Skype. Hi, Eric. Hello, how are you guys doing? Oh, pretty good. Mm. Um, do I have that correct? Uh, force measurements can be used for, what, friction measurements, tensile measurements, compression, all sorts of tests for both products and the work environment. That is correct. Okay. You know, it can be used for many, many different things. Perfect. Now, you were in our studio a couple of weeks ago or a week or so ago to demo some of Starrett's force measurement equipment. I believe the, the, the first uh, demo we did was of a, um, of a handheld uh, gauge. Is that right? That's correct. We were showing the uh, handheld. It was a, a DFC for uh, the force gauge. 
Okay, and, and, uh, and set that up, up for us just a, a little bit. Um, uh, basically, you know, where, where you might use a, a handheld force gauge, for instance. It can be used for any number of things, like how much force does it take to open a door for making sure that the doors uh, comply to the ADA Act for people in wheelchairs to be able to open a door um, to any number of things like uh, in an automotive uh, car, you know, pressing switches and buttons and stuff like that. You want to measure how much force it takes to do that. Okay, so we're going to roll this clip in just one second, but remember, send questions to us via email at qdl at qualitydigest.com, tweet at qualitydigest, or use the chat feature. So let's take a look at the, uh, roll that clip of the handheld force gauge from Sterrett. Um, okay, Eric, well, thanks for joining us. I see that we've got, uh, what, three pieces of equipment out here on the table? Uh, what are we looking at? Well, Derek, we've got our, basically our L1 system. So this is basically our low force stuff. Um, we have two different uh, force gauge models. Okay. Three different models of standard height test stands. And then we also have the extended that you see over here. Anything with an X is an extended. And, and by different models, I'm assuming just different frame sizes? Is that? Okay. Different capacities. Different capacities, okay. So it's All either right. different travel or different capacities. So okay. 110 model, 330 or 550. Right here we've got an L1 system, which is basically running off of the load cell in a tablet. Okay. Or we have the standalone, which is right over in front of you. That basically, you can drive the system up and down by pressing the buttons, and it just goes at a controlled speed, whatever you want it to do. Okay. So as soon as you let off the buttons, it stops. Or you can do something very unique, industry first. Okay. In our DFC model, it is a controller. So in what that means is the force gauge firmware only controls the test stand. And There's when you no say software or computer hooked up to it, it's the force gauge doing everything. So when you say when you say industry first, you mean it's it's the first to be able to be both a, a standalone gauge and a controller? Well, it's the first to be a standalone and a controller, but controlling it via firmware only. Oh, okay, okay, okay. So that's that was the, the big challenge there. Doing and that was it. that's important for like the the medical device industries where software Correct. becomes kind of a bug the validation gets yeah, a little right, right, sticky right. there, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. And, and costly. Okay, uh, let's take a closer look at this. Uh, if we can go over here to the gauge cam, um, several things uh, I want to point out. Uh, one of the first things I noticed when you brought this in is uh, here where you were here where you put in put on your attachments. I noticed that uh, where you put them on, this has got flats on it. What are, what are those, uh, what's the purpose of that? Well, we found that in the past, there's a lot of load cells gets damaged by people putting on different grips and adapters and okay. stuff like that, and they tend to over tighten them. So this uh, allows okay. you to put a wrench on there to tighten it up so you don't torque your load cell. And oh, so rather it. than you put it on there and just <laughs> crank yeah. it, you would put a backing wrench on it and Correct, tighten it. And, and, and tighten then, it up. And, and not, okay, not mess things up. Um, you know, I was playing with this earlier. That I, I want to point out to people, this is actually uh, very ergonomic. Um, uh, you got a nice little little grip here. Uh, some of these are like holding a brick. Brick, yeah. Uh, and this, you got a nice little handle. Uh, fits, you know, I think most people would feel comfortable holding this. Not too heavy. It's balanced. Feels good. That was one of the main objectives is it's going to be a hand gauge. Make it fit your <laughs> hand, you know. So <laughs> instead of trying to carry a yeah, brick. Yeah. So yeah. that was one of the things we looked at. It's easy. It's comfortable to use all day long. Um, and you know it, it it definitely feels balanced in your hand it's not top heavy where you're trying to to hold it right and all the uh, uh, I, uh, all the push buttons I mean I'm not an expert at using these but I kind of understand how they work uh, this button over here looks like it allows me to uh, adjust my um, my unit so I saw Newton's uh, gram force uh, kilogram force pound force Newton's let's go back to pound force here uh, so you have the two keys that are pointing to the arrows to the outside pointing away. Okay. Those are both programmable. That means you can select them to do whatever you want them to do. Okay. Um, you know, either doing units, could be start, stop, could be transmit. It could be anything that you want it to do okay. on those two buttons in whatever configuration the force gauge is in. So if you're in the force gauge controller mode, that would be your start button and the other one may be return or it may be transmit or whatever you want it to be. Okay. You can program those keys to do it. Now I notice that take a measurement, like right now it looks like the arrow pointing down means this is a compression measurement, right? Right, uh, peak compression. Okay. So if you noticed, when you push down on the, the uh, little hook there, okay. it freezes the display whenever you let go. Oh, now okay. it's showing you what your maximum force was when you're doing it. You hit the zero button, zeroes it. Okay. 
do it um, again. Do it okay. again. So right. it's fairly easy to use. I mean, it's not really over complicated. Okay. Uh, if you hit the arrow button that you were just hitting again, you'll notice now it'll put it in tension. Oh, okay. Opposite and now direction. when you pull it, okay. it does the opposite direction and oh, freezes okay. it. Yeah. We also have average mode in there in real time. Okay. Now I notice on the back, uh, there's a like something with a with a hole in it. I mean, what's what's that for? Right. So basically, all the load that's our, our basically where a load pin. Okay. And if you noticed up on the frame on the FMM here, you'll see a little pin on the oh, adapter on the, block. On the, on the, okay. Uh -huh. So that just goes inside the. It goes inside the okay. hole, and then now oh, basically all the, the load. We have to go the other way. I'm assuming. Correct. Okay. Correct. All right. Right. So all the load's going through that pin. So we have four little screws that hold the onto the mounting block. Okay. And you're ready to go. Uh, I notice the display's upside down. I'm assuming that can be flipped over. Okay. Just go right. into settings, flip the display, and okay. now you're ready to go. So now this basically is the smarts for a dumb stand. Correct. Right. This, the stand is just a motor, all essentially, your, right? right? All okay. your load, um, PID, everything is it's programming through the gauge itself. So you want to set your speed or whatever, you set it in the force gauge, and, and okay. then away you go. And Bluetooth communication? Yep. Bluetooth okay. out to 30 feet. So you put it, hook it up to the RS-230 mode and plug it in the back of the stand and okay. put the gauge in test mode and you're ready to go. Uh, basically battery operated uh, storage, you can store how, how many measurements? A store 100. 100, okay. And obviously you could be downloading the measurements as you go anyway. Uh, if Blue you wanted to Bluetooth or stay them in the gauge okay. and, you know, for transmitting later. Okay. Um, I know there's some other software functions you want to show us and, and rather than try to do it with the camera pointing at the display here, uh, you have a simulator that we can run and we'll just talk over the... Correct. The okay. So now we're in the simulator. Uh, this is our Starrett software simulator for the force gauges. You can do either DFC or DFG. We're doing the DFC on this one. The battery indicator, your force directions, and all the other stuff. But if you come down to the menu button, you can see it's very, very simple to look at the different things that you can do, real-time modes or units or whatever. But if you scroll around using these keys, just to flip the display, how easy it, it is to flip the display is just basically navigate through, come down to where it says flip display, and hit flip, and then just back out. So oh, okay. you can see real quick, I'm just going to flip it and then flip it back to show you. So now it's obviously flipped, right? Okay, right, right. So now we can go in and scroll through and flip it back. So not very difficult to do. Obviously, you're not going to be doing this all the time uh, once you flip the display you're going to basically stay in that mode because it'll be hooked up to the stand and stuff like that. So you can see okay. how easy it was to flip and flip back. Right. Also in the simulator, it allows you to apply a load. So if you notice down here, there's a little green bar. Right. And as I apply a load to either direction, now I've applied the load, and when I come back, you can see, as I drag it back, you can see that these little anchors down here kind of stay and tell you where it is. So oh. you can see on the compression side, it's actually frozen at that peak one. Okay. Again, I can do it again just by resetting it and hitting the, the load over now here. Now I'm assuming you can set, uh, you can also set uh, like test limits if you wanted to set this up to do go, no go, right? You can go, do it, go, no go. Okay. All those are done by literally hitting the menu, going it in, turning your tolerances oh, okay. on and off. All right. So you can have your limit one, limit two, so you can do that. You can have it beep. Okay. So many, many, many things you can do in this software or the firmware that's in here. Uh, okay, so, th so thanks. I, that was much easier on the simulator. Yeah. Um, so again, this is the, the, the DFC and the DFG. Are our force gauges. Uh, force gauges. Uh, so the DFC is if it's functioning as a controller, DFG if it's... Just a basic just a, gauge. Basic. And, and, and you do you buy them separately that way, or yep. you buy it as a DFC or a DFG? Either or, or, a DFD or, or a DFC, and then we have the different capacities. So okay. that's how the gauges are bought off of the size of the capacity in the model. Okay, terrific. Well, thanks, Eric. Appreciate Thank that. Yeah, that was a uh, that was a great great demo. Really versatile, uh, really versatile tool. The handheld force gauge. We actually do have a couple questions uh, related to that. Uh, before we get to the questions from our audience, I had a question myself, and I think you may have touched on it on there. Maybe I didn't uh, catch it, Eric. But um, about the um, uh, the ruggedness of it, maybe the the IP rating, uh, uh, you know, drop resistance, you know, from a bench, that sort of thing. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, it's all tested uh, for. Uh 
being able to drop from a bench from like three feet without any damage. If you noticed on all the corners of the gauge, they're all rounded. So as the uh, unit strikes the floor, it dissipates all the energy. Okay, and I believe, what was the, what was the IP rating of the, um, of the, of the force gauge? There's no IP rating on that. No, it's, no IP uh, rating on the case. Okay, so just just rugged for 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 a drop test. Great. Okay, now we have a couple correct. questions. Uh, a couple questions from our audience. Let's take those. And uh, while we're getting those questions up, just a reminder: uh, if you have questions, send them to us at qdl at qualitydigest.com or tweet us at qualitydigest or chat to us. Okay, yeah, let's see right. that first question. All right. What are some typical applications or industries or operations? where this equipment is used? It can be used for any number of things uh, from <laughs> a very expensive fish scale <laughs> to um, doing coefficient of friction on the floor uh, with the fixture to you know how much force does it take this to pull it apart or to do an insertion uh, say in a rivet into a hole. Uh, there's so many different industries and so many different things these things can be used on uh, I'm surprised every day when I see a new one. Now, I think you, you mentioned to me uh, a while ago about even measuring puncturing, you know, how much force it takes to puncture the lid of like a, one of those portable coffee pods or something like that, right? I mean, there's really a wide variety of pretty much any place where you want to know what it takes to do something, you, 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 can, you can use this. Correct. I mean, it, you know, from, you know, the prepackaged uh, products that are out there, how much force does it take to uh, puncture through it. Um, for example, if a woman was taking her nail and puncturing through, or somebody was puncturing through a foil or a film, you know, how much force does it take to do that? Uh, right. If it's too hard, then you obviously can't get open it up. So you want to know what the the puncture force is. Right, I, and I believe also you, you mentioned uh, uh, we we mentioned it briefly uh, friction. I, I, guess, I guess on that you're just pulling some sort of what like a calibrated sled or some sort of sled across a floor if you want to measure like slip resistance or that sort of thing. That's correct. There's basically a, a predetermined diameter um, sled and weight. There's two different medias that they use, one being for ISO, one being uh, for the US. Uh, they have two different uh, faces on them. And what you'll do is you'll actually start pulling the sled and you can do it a, basically a load over a load or a load over a time. And it'll give you the average load and calculate the uh, coefficient of friction for you. Yeah, that's pretty cool. That's uh, great. Looks like we have another yep. question. We've got another question. I'll, I'll, I'll take this one if we can throw it up on the screen there. And we'll, we'll take a look, see. Um, hmm, okay, so a, a user wants to know what does L1 mean? Does Starrett produce other ranges of force equipment? Yes, the L1 is referring to um, basically a software package. Uh, Starrett makes uh, obviously the L1, we make an L2, an L2 plus, and an L3 being our material test package. So it's referring to a software package, and when the software package is combined with the system, say the FMM, then it becomes the L1 test system. Okay. And, um, you know, uh, so what we were talking about just now, we we're talking about your, your handheld, your mm -hmm. handheld gauge. Uh, we, also have, uh, we also have some bench, or Starrett, I should say, makes some bench top force gauges that uh, we're going to look at here in just a little bit. Why don't you set that up a little bit? Why, where might you use a bench top force gauge? Well, the, uh, the FMM, or the uh, system that you're going to see next, is basically used to apply a force at a given speed that whatever the customer wants to pull something at, uh, and what you do that why it's used that way is to get the repeatability from test to test to test. If you were doing it basically on a manual system, you would not get the same repeatability from the equipment where the operator would add an influence into it. So the stand either runs at whatever load you want to go to or whatever speed you want to go at consistently over and over again. Okay, and um, so we're going to run a clip here of a demo that we did of uh, one of your benchtop force gauges. So why don't we take a look at that? Okay, Eric, in our, in our last segment, we were focusing, or you were focusing, I should say, mostly on the, uh, on the, on the handheld force gauge, right? That's correct, the okay. DFC. The DFC, right. And now we've got a test stand in front of us. Uh, uh, what I see here is a, what, a, a motorized test stand, looks like a load cell, and then some smarts, a little tablet over here off to the side, right? Correct, this is our L1 system. Okay. So you can tell it by the, the load cell and the tablet being the DRO. 
Okay. So very, very easy setup system. Again, it's one of three different configurations that you can do with the FMM. Again, stand only, or you can do it with the DFC, okay. control in the stand, or the L1 system that we have here. All right. Uh, looks like a very simple uh, uh, operator panel. Yeah, <laughs> it's pretty simple. That, like two, two, I say two buttons and a knob. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> and, and an emergency up, switch. <laughs> up, down, and set your speed. Uh, okay. So you can set your speed literally by dialing in what you want. And that's in inches a minute. If you want millimeters a minute, press and hold. Okay. And they, that comes up. Now, when you're in the L1 configuration or the DFC, no matter what speed you have dialed in here, either the gauge will override it, and it because the gauge is controlling the stand or the software will okay. tell it to do So whatever. this is strictly if you're running in manual, manual mode, mode, you don't have anything else hooked up to it, you're just going to manually uh, Correct. M move the stage yourself. And I guess also in manual mode you've got, uh, you've got a scale off here, a distance scale off to the side. Yeah, that's okay. pretty much how you, you, <laughs> you measure how far you went with the little scale on here. Okay. Uh, in the other two modes, you know, we've got the encoder on the inside, so the gauge reads the feedback from the encoder or the L1 software does as well. So that's how it, it judges speed and distance and everything. Okay. Uh, tell us a little bit about this plate down here. Well, everyone likes options to mount stuff. So we have four different hole mounting options down here from M4, M6, M10, or an M12. And if you notice, we have the little wall out holes here to allow you to move it around so that you can keep everything in perfect alignment. Okay. On an S-beam load cell or the force gauge, you want to make sure that your load's going straight through and doesn't have offset loading. Right. Uh, otherwise, you'd get uh, inaccurate readings? Uh, it could damage your load cell. Oh, could <laughs> or that. Okay. Yeah, that's that's a bad part, so you don't want to do that. <laughs> right, okay. So. Uh, and I should say that the software interface is pretty much as simple as the, <laughs> as the panel interface. Yeah, well, you, well, last time we were here, we talked about the L2 software. Well, right. this is a simplified version of L2. Okay being L1. So when you look at the software, it, it's pretty simple. You have the, your load and your distance uh, on the DRO. Okay. And under where it says test, you have your test that you wrote before. Okay. So you can select from any one of those. Or we can create a new test. Okay. Uh, so let's, let's do that. Okay. So let's hit the it. icon with the star at the bottom. Okay. That one there. And if you noticed, you have four different uh, test choices. Yep. Load test, distance test, break test and cycle test. Let's do a distance test real quick. Okay. All right. Now if you notice when it comes up, you get two choices, either tension or compression. Obviously we're set up for the tension okay. aspect of this. So Got a rubber like band on there. Yeah, right. only the finest. And let's go ahead and do a target distance, say four inches. All right. And let's do a speed of 20 inches a minute. 20 inches a minute. Okay, I'm just, just following your lead here. 20 inches, oops, 20. There we go. Okay. All right. So next we want to do is we want to go to pretest. That's up there. Yeah. Click that. All right. Okay. Any standard instrument, you want to make sure it's zeroed out. So let's zero load, zero distance. Okay. And if you go to where it says setting, all the way at the top. Oh, right. We want to go where it says set home. Then all we're doing here is just saying, hey, remember where you're at. Set so home. set home, yes. Okay. Now if you go to the bottom icon and well, click that. The little uh, uh -huh. arrow? Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. And now you want to go ahead and return home. Uh, return home? Yes. Uh, yes. Okay. Now hit the green check mark twice. Okay. Check one. Do again. Okay. And we want to save it, obviously. Save it. Oh, okay. Save it whatever number it comes up. Let's okay. just hit done. But I could type anything I wanted you in there. You can go back okay. and rename it any time. Okay. So All right, that's when, it. It, when it comes up, let's just hit start test. All right, we'll do it. That easy. That's pretty that straightforward. Easy. Even I can do it. All right. <laughs> so as you can see on the screen here, the test is running. You're getting your data as it's coming up. Right. You can see it's stretching out that rubber band there. Yeah. So it's going to return because that's what you told it to do. So it's okay. returning home. And if you don't mind, when it gets done, go ahead and hit start test one more time for me, okay? Okay. Uh, start test over here. All right. Okay, now it's perfect. And right. when it comes back to home, this time here, if you don't mind, touch the number, the run number one okay. for me. Now, I'm assuming also as it's taking data, you could set limits. And Correct. It could tell you whether it was within limits or outside of limits. Okay. Correct, yes. So press the one button. Uh-huh. So now you'll notice there's the two runs oh, that okay. we just did overlaid. Okay. And uh, to your to your point about limits, 
the data that's on the side would go red. The numbers would go red if it fell out of whatever okay. limits that you set. And it, with each run, I could keep overlaying multiple runs. As many runs times it, as you want. And you could do stuff like uh, uh, average the runs and, and that sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, various operations on it. Okay. Very, very simple. Okay. Um, so that's, that's all there is to it. That's all there is to programming it. Okay. That is it. Okay, and so you very would just, easy to use. You would just change your load cell based on the different uh, load capacities that you're trying to run. Okay, I mean, you want to make sure you stay within okay. not a real big load cell. And um, the calibration information for load cell is stored in the chip in the back. Okay, so, so when when the, when the load cell hooks up to the to plug the and device, plug. it, plug it and knows plug. everything about it. Okay, yep, you're ready right. to go. Okay, oh, that seems pretty straightforward. Run through us again the, uh, the different sizes uh, of the frames. Well, we have three different standard sizes, the 110, the 330, and the 550, and we have extended column or travel, which is the 110X, 330X, and the 550X. Okay, terrific. Thanks, Eric. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you. All right. Well, thanks, uh, thanks, Eric, for showing us. Uh, th those were the bench top, that was the bench top uh, force measurement tester. Um, so one thing that I, I'm not sure we really covered in there uh, really fully is the ability to export data so you know if people need uh, if people need their their test reports for clients you know customers uh, you know suppliers that sort of thing um, there's a lot of capabilities in terms of being export that that data send it out to them that's correct you can uh, if you're using the L1 system with the tablet uh, you can have it directly connected onto their network or whatever and as any standard Windows 10 system it'll put data wherever you want to put it if you're using the DFC configuration, then you can either store the data in the gauge or you can actually have it Bluetooth out to uh, a PC and have it go ahead and store the data as, as you're taking it. Yeah, no, actually, let's, let's touch on that a little bit. Um, so are you seeing, j just from, from your, your, uh, your customers, are you seeing more interest in I hope I get these right. The DFC, which is the the force, the, the, the handheld, which you can mount to a benchtop system, or are you seeing more interest in more the integrated system, what, which we just looked at? You know, it, it's it's based on uh, the customer need. If they have something where, um, say, that the, the uh, L1 system won't work for them because it's the it's cost prohibitive to get the software validated, then you would go with the DFC. If they want to go ahead and have multiple tests preloaded on the system, the L1 is the way to go. So if you can have all your tests predefined, all the operator would do is walk up, scan a barcode, or tap the test they want to run on the display, and away they go. So yeah, it's I mean, basically was, based on the customer's needs. Yeah, that was an that was an important bit that that I'm not sure people caught when we were talking about on, on that earlier clip on the handheld on the handheld gauge because it's it's firmware. Um, that helps really smooth things over when you're uh, selling it within the uh, the medical device market. That's correct. Um, you don't want any ability to make any changes for the operator to make any changes uh, to meet like the CFR 21 Part 11 compliance. So the firmware based only system really helps out in that requirement because there's nothing to change. Well, now we got we got a couple more questions from the audience, but before we, we go to them, uh, I want to remind you all, of course, you can send your questions in to, to QDL at qualitydigest.com. Uh, you can uh, find us on Twitter at Quality Digest or use the little chat function uh, on your screen there if you want to send us a question via chat. And I want to point out, you know, we got a, 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 a kind of a big show here today. We're doing a lot of different segments. Um, you know, if your questions come in and we don't get to them in this particular segment, send them in anyway. We'll, we'll kind of wrap them up at the end of the show. And also, if we don't happen to even wrap them up at the end of the show, uh, we'll forward your questions on to the, sure. the application engineers that we've had on the show here today, and, and they'll answer them uh, directly via email for you uh, after the show or, or later this weekend or maybe next week. All right, yep. so let's move on. We had, uh, did have a question that I understand from the audience. Um, I have plants in Mexico. Do you have translation to Spanish? Hmm, interesting question. Uh, in, the, in both packages, we do. Uh, this, the force gauge has Spanish in it, and then if you switch over uh, in the language section, you can select Spanish in, uh, in the L1 software. How many languages are in that, that software? I think we're up to five or six different languages in both. Great, great. Uh, and I think we had one, one other uh, I heard that came in, so let's take a look at that one. Um, Okay, what differentiates the new Starrett handheld force gauges from others that are on the market? 
Well, there's a couple things. Uh, when we looked at designing everything, we wanted to be the newest and freshest, so we incorporated as many new things as we possibly can, and one of them being uh, the ability to meet any protocols that the customer may want to run, Bluetooth, RS-232, USB, um, anything of that nature, we wanted to make sure we encompass that. So, uh, you know, not having any legacy issues, we were able to start with a clean piece of paper. So, like the DFC and the firmware only, uh, the L1, super easy to use. You know, we were, we were trying to go for the ease of use for an operator that doesn't have to be trained over and over again when they try to use the product. Okay, and I think, I, I, did I see another question flash up there? I think we had one other question so far, yeah. Let's take a look at that one. Okay. Um, how would I choose, oh, you, you had mentioned, yeah, okay, you had mentioned that there were several different size units of the, of the bench top. So this question addresses that. How would I choose which capacity to purchase if I bought the 500 pound if I bought the 500 foot-pound unit but only needed five foot-pound max, would I be sacrificing accuracy or features or are the higher capacity models more expensive? Well, they're all the same price, so that, that's not an issue. Um, being anything in force measurement is always based on a full scale instead of, of reading. So what you'd want to do is just like a pressure gauge or anything else, you want to make sure that the range you're going to operate in is pretty much mid-scale of the uh, force gauge or the test stand you're going to use. So if you don't want to run them always, always at full scale for a chance of an overload, but you don't want to use them at the bottom of the scale either because that's the least accurate for anything in force measurement. And, and I believe, and I'm not, I'm, I'm not real familiar with how force gauges work, but as, as long as we, you have the frame size which can withstand a certain amount but really you're using the, the load cell I think is what you said the load cell is what kind of determining what range you're going to to measure within right that's correct so all our frames are based off of the max capacity of the frame being a 110 a 330 or a 550 that's the maximum force that it'll go up to at maximum speed which would be 40 inches a minute so you want to make sure that you scale the load cell properly Right. So, so just so, I, again, I'm, just, I'm a geek on these things. I, I got to learn something all the time. So you could have a 500 foot-pound capable benchtop unit, but put, yeah, a, 10, put, put a 10 foot-pound load cell in it if you were going to be measuring within that, that range of 10 foot-pounds. That's correct. So okay. any time that you mount either a external load cell or the force gauge, the, irregardless of the capacity of the frame. Okay. All systems will stop at the max capacity that's connected to an either 10 pound load cell or the force gauge. Got it, got it, great, thanks Eric. Learn something new every day. Well there you go, <laughs> Eric, you're, 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 and you are a geek, definitely. <laughs> well great, all right. Well thanks Eric, and again, anyone, uh, if you do have more questions, uh, we're, we're coming up towards the end of the segment, but if you do, uh, certainly send, us to, send us them to us anyway at QDL at QualityDigest.com uh, or uh, find us on Twitter at Quality Digest or, or chat to us and we'll get them to Eric uh, after the show. He'll get back to you after that. Well, that'll do it for the first segment of the show. But before we move on, of course, we'd like to thank our sponsor for the segment, the LS Starrett Company. The L1 system is the latest addition to Starrett's complete range of force measurement equipment. Whether your requirements are simple or highly advanced, Starrett has the equipment, software, and technical expertise to provide superior solutions for strength and material testing. From application analysis, system specification, installation and training, to post-installation field services, the excellence of the Starrett line is matched by the quality and comprehensive range of their services. For more information, visit online at www.starrett.com or call 978-249-3551. Well, Eric Perkins, thanks again for joining us today. Thank you for coming in and giving us that great demo a couple of weeks back, and uh, we really appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye. Okay, Thanks. Take care. Talk to you soon, Eric. Bye-bye now. Yeah, good, good stuff there, Dirk. I think that, um, that you know, we, as you say, you're, you're a geek. Um, yep. And, you know, we're all geeks here. We're right? all geeks, yep. Many in our audience probably are, too. Um, but, uh, but, yeah, you know, you learn, learn something new from that demo. I think really yeah. a couple of good That's why I like having demos come in, because, because, I mean, we see this equipment all the time at trade shows, but yep. you don't always have time to actually learn something kind of in-depth about it. And so when they come into the studio, it gives us a lot of chance to really ask our own personal questions as complete dummies in this field. Right. Is to really approach it from, from the just point of some 
view of somebody who's just interested in learning mm -hmm. and what this equipment does and how it works. Beginner's mind. Yeah, so beginner's as, mind. As we say, yeah. So good yeah. stuff there from, uh, from Sarah and Eric Perkins. Well, you know, we're going to be back at you with more demos and questions and answers, Q&A, later in the show. But for now, however, we're going to take a few minutes to consider the, uh, the broader implications of technology and manufacturing. In this case, as it affects and is affected by uh, international trade and far-flung supply chains. That's right. You know, earlier this week, uh, Mike and I connected via Skype with Gordon Stiles. Now, we've had Gordon Stiles on the show before. He is the founder and president of a company by the name of Star Rapid, and they're a low-volume Chinese manufacturer specializing in prototyping tool and 3D mental uh, mental, metal printing. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And we talked to Gordon uh, about a wide range of issues, including the, uh, the pros and cons of automation, the differences between North American and Asian manufacturers, the business reality of trade policy, and a lot more. So let's, let's take a look at that clip now. Well, we're here with Gordon Stiles. He is the president and founder of Star Rapid in China. Gordon, thanks for joining us today. Good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's get right into it. Now, in your opinion, would you say that automation within manufacturing is more of a threat or more of an opportunity? Well, I think it has to be an opportunity, uh, uh, psychologically, uh, because you don't want to be worrying too much about what's going to be happening in the next 25, 35, 45 years in regards to artificial superintelligence and the possibility that every human on the planet is out of a job. So. Uh, my personal view is that I, you know, I'm looking on a sort of 10, 15 year horizon and I'm certainly investing like crazy in technology. Uh, it has to be an opportunity because the only way that you can compete with your, your direct competitors is to invest not only in technology but also in human skills. You've got to wrap your technology with a really, really big uh, coating of good human customer service and technical skills. And what, what would you say are the, the, the key, what are the key differences in how Western European or North American manufacturers go about their business versus those in China? Is, is there that much of a difference? Uh, not a huge amount of difference, but there are differences. Uh, one of the things that I think you see in the West is because we have a much, much longer uh, uh, tradition of running sort of entrepreneurial businesses is that you find that the guys who are running the businesses really are running them because they enjoy running those businesses. You know, they enjoy being in that technology or in that business. Here, I think it's very much still about how to make as much money as possible so that you can get it out into property, for example. There's, it's almost like the businesses are not the primary purpose. The primary purpose is to build up a huge property portfolio. So you tend not to see the reinvestment here uh, that you would see maybe in a German Mittelstand style company, for example, where it's passed generation to generation and almost all the profits are reinvested. So you see less of that here, I think. And does, does, that, does that cause any differences in terms of the way the way a Chinese company might run in terms of the way of, of a US company might run? Yes, I mean, you, in the US and Europe, you see a lot more plans for in investment in technology and training. Here, I think there's a much shorter term view of business. Now, um, that leads to certain problems. For example, uh, companies here do come and go quite rapidly. Whereas in the West, you tend to see established companies lasting for very, very, very long times. And you, you're actually very well positioned to, to talk about these, these differences because you have kind of an interesting story about how you actually came to China, as maybe people could detect from your accent. You're, uh, you're from the UK. Um, but you actually went to China not only to start a, a business, but to live there as well, right? That's correct. I had had a couple of businesses in the UK and uh, in 3D printing. And then I came here in 2005. Uh, with uh, pretty much no money to my name and I just started a business on a whim and 12 years later we've got like 275 people and we're certainly one of the world's leading I guess rapid prototyping rapid manufacturing companies 
That's amazing. Well, Gordon, there's a great deal of, of conversation these days about trade policy and, and protectionism, especially here in the U.S. So what do you see as the benefits of a world economy built on the principles of free trade? And, and what are the risks? Uh, I, I think one of the biggest risks of free trade is that if you are operating in an environment like that, at the one that we have today, the government and the population as a whole has to be uh, very committed to investment in technology and training related to that technology. You have to be really pushing very, very hard to get your population skilled up and ready to compete on an international basis. If you do not do that, uh, you will get destroyed as a country. Uh, we've seen many countries in the world suffering recently from this. Uh, countries that are not suffering are places like Switzerland and Germany uh, and also China for that uh, matter. Uh, you know, they're investing very, very heavily in trade skills, uh, in engineering skills at university and massive investment in technology. And finally, um, what would you tell people considering manufacturing as a career. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure about there in, in, in China, but in, I know in the UK and, and also here in the United States that manufacturing for a long time has been viewed as kind of, well, th th that's some place you go if you don't go to college, mm -hmm. you know, that, that kind of thing. But it, that's, that's slowly changing. So what would you tell people considering manufacturing or, or as a career? What are the skills needed to compete in the industrial world of tomorrow? Yeah, I mean, as, as an employer myself, uh, both having been in the UK and in China, the, the biggest single problem I have is getting, for example, CNC machining guys who are highly skilled or tool makers who are highly skilled. Uh, children are being put off these uh, uh, disciplines by this belief that somehow you don't need industry and manufacturing to, to be successful as a country. And that's absolute nonsense. In fact, without industry manufacturing and science, you, you, you don't have a country. You, you, you're, you're going to die, you know, wither on the vine. So I would say um, if you want an opportunity for the next 10, 15 years, definitely CNC machining, tool making, any of these trades where the companies themselves are, are finding it very, very difficult to hire people. I mean, the, you know, you, you're probably not going to get rich doing it unless you start your own business in that field, but you certainly can have a, a very, very good salary uh, going into the future. And there are less and less people doing it. And, and I would actually like to just give a shout out here for a, for a fabulous uh, American company called Tight titans of cnc i don't know if you know these guys it's a guy called titan gilroy and he has actually started uh, an online apprenticeship program for cnc machinists around the world and he's been into i think it's san quentin prison and started a an apprenticeship program inside a prison and actually years ago i wrote about how important it is to give uh, for example uh, the short-term prisoners uh, a, a life skill and that helps them to not reoffend. So I have to say there are pockets uh, in America, for example, Titan is a damn good example of that. And, and I really take my hat off to him. Uh, and he's definitely someone you should bring on your show. Titans, Titans of CNC? Titans of CNC. Titan, Titan Gilroy. That's right. Well, you know, you, know you, you mentioned something and we, we've talked to folks in the UK as well. In the United States, uh, vocational training and apprenticeships, you know, were really popular uh, early on in the century, uh, early on in the, in the in the 20th century, and then they slowly yeah. waned. And, but now they seem to be making a resurgence of uh, vocational training and apprenticeship programs, as well as, from what I understand, in the UK as well. It's almost like people recognize that it's important to to get these these people trained back up again. Yeah, I, I think post uh, crash, you saw a lot of. Um, politicians who would normally talk about a post-industrial society starting to utter the words manufacturing and skills again. And this is because I think they're waking up to the fact that uh, there is a direct uh, inverse, well, direct correlation as your industry and manufacturing skills and capability declines, so does your economy, so does your wealth base. It's that simple. If you're not investing in the youth and investing in uh, low and high tech skills of any kind, uh, you, you are setting your country up for decline. It's that simple. Well, Gordon Stiles, founder and president of Star Rapid in China, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we'll see you soon, Gordon. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. So long.
Wait, is it live or is it memorized? Well, don't, that was confusing. <laughs> so this is live. What you just saw was recorded. Well, I'm live and you're recorded <laughs> yeah. right now. And actually, we'll both be recorded if you're watching this tomorrow. That's so. right. It's okay. it's we try to be as confusing as we can. <laughs> was, we uh, couldn't get him on this. We couldn't get him on the show live because he's like 13 he's, he's hours. in it China, like so it would have been morning, yeah, so. a little would have been a little yeah. early for him. Recorded, amazing. but uh, yeah, good good segment there from Gordon Salz. We want to get into that a little bit more, but before we do so, I want to uh, let you all know. So we got a question actually right as we were beginning that that taped interview. <laughs> With Gordon uh, for Eric Eric Perkins and Starrett, which he's Who gone now. Live. He was live. <laughs> now he's gone. He's gone now. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I just want to encourage you all uh, get your questions in early. Um, we're going to see some more demos here later today. Same kind of thing. You're going to see the demos go. And when you have questions during those demos, get them in. Get your questions in so we have time to to, to address them with our our, uh, our application engineers. Uh, again, know, qdlqualitydigest.com. You can tweet us at, at Quality Digest at, on Twitter or just chat. Or chat, chat function. Right, right. I mean, I, w I wanted to follow up a little bit. I mean, I think, you know, and, and we probably won't get a whole lot into it in the show. Maybe mm. at the end we will. But that what we were talking about towards the end of Gordon's interview, yeah. but just the importance of, and, and kind of, the, there is a change going on right now within within both the UK and the United States where vocational training and apprenticeships and, and all of a sudden all this stuff that was kind of, oh, you know, we don't want, we, we want every, everybody to have a college education. Nobody should be going to vocational school. Yeah. That's really changing it now. It, it's slowly, but people are realizing that, look, there's good paying uh, jobs and high tech jobs even yes. within the manufacturing field. And that's actually part of what Manufacturing Day is all about. Yep. But it's also kind of a general, thing that's going on, we're, and we're seeing it, I'm sure in other countries, but certainly seeing it within the UK and the United States, where people are realizing, hey, let's get these apprenticeship programs uh, cranked back up again. Let's get those vocational schools yeah. bringing in people who don't want to go to college. They want to work in industry well, if you train them up And for that it. was the way it was. That was <laughs> the way it was, it was a few, yeah. few decades ago, yeah. was that your normal course of action would, would be you'd, you'd complete a high school education and you'd, you'd enter basically a vocational training program with a company. Right. You get kind of a probational pay for a period of time and then at some point you become a master and then you train people after yeah. you. So that system worked but, pretty but well. Typically, typically what was going on is that if you couldn't afford to go to college, well, you went to vocational school. Sure. And then as, you know, kind of the standard of living rates, then it's like, no, everybody should go to college. Yeah. And, oh, you don't want to tend, you know, you don't want them to go into manufacturing. I mean, I'm kind of exaggerating <laughs> a little bit, but that was kind of yeah. it. Yeah. It's like, no, you got to go to college to get a good job. Yeah. Even people who didn't, students who's like, no, I like working right. on cars. <laughs> I like building things. I don't yeah. want to go to college. Exactly. I want to work and use my hands. <laughs> exactly, you know? exactly. Well, you know, Gordon, that was All a good right. interview. I mean, Gordon, Gordon talked about a lot of stuff, uh, certainly internationally. Nationally, we know that the world of manufacturing, uh, yeah. it's flat, it's getting flatter all the time and uh, competing on the international stage, it takes, you know, it takes not only pricing power, but you have to be innovative, right? You have to be fast on the market. Um, and there's a lot going on and, and STEM education too is a big thing. So yeah. we'll be uh, considering these and other issues uh, coming up later in the show. This segment of our show is sponsored by Faro, the world's most trusted source for 3D measurement and imaging solutions. Well, now we're going to turn to another uh, close-up look at an important class uh, of test and measurement equipment, in this case, the Quantum S scan arm from Faro Technologies. Now, right. Faro was one of the originators of articulating arms, also known as portable coordinate measuring machines. PCMMs. Arms, PCMMs, that's right. Arms first took high precision inspection right out onto the production line uh, back in the 1980s. And joining us now in the studio to look at the Quantum S arm is Raphael Hasman of Faro Technologies. So thanks for joining us, Raphael. Hey, it's my pleasure, guys. Uh, of course, yeah. of course. Now, uh, before we take a look at the, at the Quantum S, um, just in general, I mean, for, for people who maybe looked at portable arms 15, 20 years ago. I mean, they've actually sure. been around for quite a while and then dismissed them as being too inaccurate, too cumbersome, you know, just, just didn't feel like they had the accuracy and the speed that they needed for what their for what their applications were. That has really changed a lot in the last 10 or 15 years, right? Definitely. ferro has been in business for over 30 years, and through each iteration of their arm, they've pushed the envelope. Mm -hmm. um, especially with this new Quantum S, it meets the ISO 10360 standard, which mm -hmm. we can get into a little later. Mm -hmm. But that's the toughest standard up to date for the for arms in general. And currently, that's the only arm that meets that standard, yeah. and that's again a very rigorous test and a testament to the capabilities of an arm. And I have, I myself have implemented an arm into various manufacturing um, 
processes in mm -hmm. many different industries, aerospace, um, automotive, forensics, wide, wide variety of applications. That's great. That's okay. Great. Uh, well, why don't, we, uh, why don't we run the demo that you recorded with us with your colleague Mike Kosky yesterday, and then we'll come back and take some questions uh, on the quantum scanner. But remember, send your questions to QDL and send them right away so That's we right. get them <laughs> QDL at QualityDigest.com, or you can tweet at Quality Digest, or you can use the chat feature. So as you think of those questions, don't ponder them and finesse them. <laughs> Just send them to us so that we can actually ask Rafael while he's on the show. <laughs> Let's run that clip. That's, thanks. So guys, we're going to be looking at the Quantum S, uh, the Ferro Quantum S uh, scan arm. Is that what you call it, a scan arm? Correct, yeah. yeah. This is a scan arm. It's the latest release from Ferro, our most accurate arm ever. Um, we'll show you guys what it can do with the probe as well as the laser scanning. Okay. Um, you can use those, you can hop between those two rapidly in the and software. And you got, you got both the probe and the laser scanner Correct. Both, both on the same uh, Yeah, they're the both, they're both okay, yeah. so yeah, this is our probe, that's our laser scanner. Okay. And the best um, part about that too, just to touch base, is kind of a hybrid solution. So okay. you have the ability to swap back and forth extremely fast, use the touch probe for a little bit better accuracy, and then um, you can also take off the scanner as well. It's detachable, so if you have to probe and get into tougher areas, you have oh, the ability because okay. it has the buttons on top as well. Uh, okay, gotcha, gotcha. Right on. So what we have here is our CAM2 Measure 10 software. Um, that's Ferro's proprietary software, and it's at, the ARM is capable of running on many third-party softwares. Sure. So um, what we'll do here, we have our CAD model in the software, and we're just going to go ahead and align to that. Um, you'll see Mike using our, our probe. So this is a contact-based measurement, right? Okay. Um, probe is physically touching your part. Um, that's our 6-millimeter probe, and there's a 6-millimeter a and a 3-millimeter included with the ARM. Um, beyond that, there's many different extensions and different probe sizes that you can get. Okay, and uh, tell us a little bit about probe calibration. Right, so the probe, uh, you need to calibrate it the first time you use it. That's the beauty of the Quantum S. It's going to remember the calibration for that specific probe for that three and six millimeter probe. So you can swap those um, very rapidly without needing to recalibrate each time okay. you swap. So that'll make it nicer and faster for, for an operator to get their inspection done quicker. Sure, yeah, yeah. They can just put the probe in, it already, it recognize, the electronics recognize the probe, right? And then it loads the appropriate calibration information for it. Correct, okay, correct. And it. you just switch it by using this top handle, which okay. detaches. It pops out, okay. Pops out. Right. Yeah. So, Mike, if you go and measure some circles, and uh, what we're doing here is just a very typical inspection. Um, the probe operates very similarly to a CMM, right? So. It's just handheld, and, and the beauty of, of the arm is portability, right? That's right. what we're really trying to stress with our arm. You can take this inside the shop, you can take it into the metrology lab, you can take it inside, outside. There's internal temperature compensation, so that's that's what one of the main keys that and makes it's, it very it's, portable. It's basically moisture and dust proof and all that kind yeah, of good yeah. stuff, right? Okay. Everything's enclosed in the arm, so you're not going to get any of your dust or dirt. So we, we specifically made it for the shop floor, and, and especially with, with companies, manufacturing companies that are in different environments, or whether it's winter or summer, it yeah. really is able to compensate and provide the consistent, accurate measurements all okay. the time. Cool, and just to keep you guys up to date with the inspection, what we have here, since we're aligned to our CAD, it's gonna grab all the nominal data from the CAD model. You still have the option to type in nominals from your prints and stuff like that. Just okay. important the CAD helps speed up the process. So uh, we were able to generate this bolt circle by measuring a few, cer a few features there, and you'll see this XY position data, as well as the diameter data automatically filled in and compared to your CAD. So you'll see things within tolerance show up in green, and things out of tolerance will show up in red or blue. Okay, so one, one looks like a one, that's a circle, right? The red is, is one circle that is out of tolerance then. Right, so here's- In the lower right corner, okay. Yeah, it's saying uh, some of our position is out of tolerance. Okay. Right, so uh, from there we'll go ahead and measure a few planes. I'll show you guys, it's very simple to grab uh, angle measurements, um, as well as different distances and okay. things of that nature. Very, uh, very versatile inspection program we have. So right now we're just inspecting to, uh, we're inspecting to CAD, and as he's taking the measurements, it's, uh, I notice it's actually recording the sequence of each uh, of, the, uh, of, the, of the measurements that he's taking. Correct, yeah. so um, one of the greatest capabilities of CAM2 is once you inspect your, pro inspect your part the first time, you can build a program from that initial inspection that you can then run through very rapidly, and it'll guide an operator through hundreds of different parts, ah, okay. or the same part a hundred different times. Yeah, so right. the next person would come along and it would just tell them, yes. measure this circle, measure this circle, measure this plane. Okay. Yeah. And that, yeah. that'll make it so much easier for you know any kind of operator to come up and just take the arm up and, and measure a part and get it done a lot faster Yeah, the well. screen will tell them, go here, right? Right. Yeah, measure, right. This, me measure this plane, okay. All right. yeah. 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 So um, what I'll also show you guys here in our software, you can inspect to surface since we have our CAD model in there. And that's still using the probe, right? So if you have something that's very freeform, 
Uh, we'll switch over to distance interval mode, and it's actually going to inspect the surface profile of our part using the probe, comparing okay. it to the CAD. So that's what you'll see there. That green surface is it's following the path that Mike so, scrubbed on our So part. basically, rather than points, it's actually almost like working like a, a like a scanning probe. Oh uh, yeah, we're using okay. the probe to scan and okay. take uh, take a bunch of points very rapidly. Okay, right. And after you, you're done, you can save all that information in a PDF, Excel, Word, text file, and be able to send that to internally to um, people inside the company or, of course, to suppliers, and use that almost as a traceability if somebody sure. needs to verify and see, hey, does that part pass or fail? So you can spit out a, a report as a PDF or something and have all this same information on it. Right. The, 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 okay. Everything the, that we the just recorded. Information. Right. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Cool. So up to this point, we've just been using the probe, but now we'll jump in and use that laser scanner. Um, what you'll see pop up is our blue light laser scanner. So, so it's got a, an indicator here. That's kind of the operator range. So when I get too close to the part, it turns red. When I get um, kind of a medium range, we're looking at a crosshair. So when those two line up, the laser and the crosshair, we're in perfect range to start scanning, and you can see it on the uh, Yeah, I can't quite green. see it in, the, in this view, but I, but I can, yeah, I, I can see the blue laser, but from here I can see there's a red crosshair. Yeah, exactly, yeah. So what, since we're aligned to our CAD, when he's scanning our part, you'll see that color map pop up, and that's a real-time comparison from our CAD to the scan data. So I'm collecting, the laser scanner itself, the ferro blue, collects 600,000 points per second, and it's about almost a six inch laser stripe, so you're getting a lot of coverage, being able to inspect organically shaped parts a lot faster. And I noticed you went right from probe to scanner without, I mean, basically you just change modes, right? I mean, there's nothing fancy you have to do, you just right. say, oh, I'm going to use a scanner now. Exactly, yeah, okay, yeah okay. so that and makes it a lot and, more okay. streamlined, and, yep. and um, you, know, you really understand how a part's behaving fully, because you, um, you get your data on, side the, or on the CAD model and then you get the, col the tolerance band as well. So you can adjust that based on the tolerance of the part. Okay. Right, so that's what you see with our, um, that color map there. Okay. And uh, again, so the, the beauty of the, that point cloud is it's gonna help you inspect freeform surfaces um, that you couldn't really inspect prior and, to that. And by the way, what, what was the accuracy of the, of the system here? So with the laser scanner, you're looking at a 1.9 thousandths repeatability. Okay. And just probing, it's 1.3 thousandths. Okay. Right. So. Uh, what we'll do now, uh, again, since we have that blue light laser scanner, uh, I'll show you how we can scan shiny surfaces without the need to coat your part or spray it with any kind of um, okay. coating. And we have a shiny, uh, shiny surface right here on yeah, the... Yeah, just uh, a, a diamond plate here. And that was the biggest challenge for a lot of our customers, is just being able to scan optically challenged parts. And um, so Ferro came out with this, this new blue laser, so it's able to um, capture the data uh, in real time as okay. well. And it looks like you're just scanning that just fast as you want, huh? Yeah, yeah. Again, it's capturing yep. very a high amount of points very rapidly. Yep. Um, and you can always adjust that in case uh, you're doing a large scan. You might want to turn down um, yeah, if you don't the want amount of data. Yeah, if you don't want 600,000 points a second, exactly. don't need it. Yeah. So that's and the, there it is. Uh, okay. yep. that's, the uh, that's the data we yep. were able to collect. And Pretty easy. <laughs> in real time on a shiny surface, right? So the beauty of scan data, like you saw before, you can use that to compare it to your CAD model, or you can also generate a CAD model through reverse engineering softwares. Okay. And so this was the, the Quantum S scan arm. Correct. I got Quantum right. S scan arm. <laughs> 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 Two and a half meters. Well, yep. Oh, and by the way, what, what are the different sizes? So it comes in one and a half meters. Uh, two and a half, three and a half, and four meters, which is Pharaoh's largest arm. That's a big arm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, um, uh, Raphael, Mike, uh, thanks a lot. Yep. Thank have you. A great day. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, really cool demo there. Good, good job, <laughs> Raphael and, and Mike Koski, of course. Mike couldn't be with us today, but uh, Raphael is going to sit in and answer your questions. Uh, we're getting some questions in, which is good. Um, but I uh, want to remind you all, we're going to have Raphael for the next maybe 15 minutes or so. Uh, get your questions in now. If you do have some more, uh, qdlqualitydigest.com. Uh, again, you can hit us up at Twitter, uh, at Quality Digest, or just use the chat function uh, on your screen. So, uh, so get those questions in as soon as you can. All right, let's take a look at that first question. Yep, let's look at it. Uh, how is it an enclosed system? Doesn't it have a fan to cool the laser? Uh, what comes with the system to verify it meets the accuracy spec that you claim? Mm. Um, that's a very good question. Um, so the, it's an enclosed system. There's circular encoders um, in each joint of the arm. And um, they're, they're dust proof. They're, they can operate in up to 95% humidity. Um, yes, 
The the laser does have a fan. It, it is throwing a lot of data at the at not only the computer but it, that going through that system to capture that data. Um, so there is an internal fan in the laser to uh, help maintain the heat. And um, comes what comes with the arm is a calibration cone to validate your probe as well as a a plane that you can use to measure and make sure that your that your laser scanner is measuring correctly as well. And uh, the arm comes with a one year warranty. Uh, which will include a one-year certification, which is NIST traceable. Wonderful. And I believe, just, just kind of re repeat one of the unique things about the calibration, uh, in case they didn't catch it, is that you, I believe you said you calibrate, you calibrate once, and the calibration information for that probe tip is now stored within the system itself. Correct. With the and it recognizes the probe. Right. With the new quantum, you only need to calibrate your probe once. It comes with a 6 millimeter and a 3 millimeter. And you calibrate those the first time you're going to use them, and then you can swap those, and you won't need to calibrate. So that really helps speed up the inspection process without the need to go into the software and recalibrate your probe each time. Now, the laser, as long as uh, you don't take it off, it'll stay calibrated. Um, but you do want to recalibrate the laser every time you take it on and off the system. Okay, so you, 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 mount the la you mount the laser there, you calibrate it, and then as long as it stays, as long as it stays attached, correct, then it's calibrated. Right, okay. and w w with these new probes, um, there's there's actually an adapter to use old probes. So your old probes are still uh, still going to be able to use those in your inspection process. And there's a wide catalog of different probe attachments, different extensions that you can use for very specific specific applications. Uh, but but old probes you would you would have to calibrate each time is that yes right? indeed okay, yeah okay, right, yeah okay. it doesn't have the electronics and the, the newer probes okay. right let's see another question cool. yeah I'll take this one let's all see right. uh, well that's a hard one uh, <laughs> what <laughs> length does the quantum S arm come in um, that's a great question so there's uh, this long yeah, this long. <laughs> yeah <laughs> right about here here you know um, so there's uh, four different uh, lengths one and a half meters two and a half three and a half and four meters which is actually Pharaoh's longest arm to date. Mm -hmm. Uh, it comes in a six axis variant and a seven axis. Now the six axis is gonna give you higher accuracy, but no capabilities of attaching a laser scanner. So with the seven axis, you get the ability to attach a laser scanner. So, and like when we mention length, you're not limited to the length, the length of the arm, right? You can leapfrog the arm. So if you're measuring something, let's say that's beyond four meters, you can move the arm around. That's really where the portability shines. Is, is, is there tolerance buildup when you when you do leapfrog like that? Yeah, when you do leapfrog, there's going to be um, a varying um, accuracy that you might lose, but it's, uh, it's manageable and there's a few ways you can help reduce that. Okay. Um, all right, next question. Uh, Pharaoh is touting mm. the ISO Just talked about that. Yep, yep. 10360 specification for calibration. What's so great about this, and why is it better than B89? Mm. The old, that's B89 has been around a long time. Yeah. It has indeed. So that, that's a very good question. I touched upon that right at the intro. So the 10360 um, standard is uh, just a new international standard, which um, requires five different measuring tests, uh, whereas the old B89 would only require two measuring tests. So Pharaoh's Quantum S is the only arm currently on the market that, re that reaches that ISO 10360 standard. Um, and again, those five tests make, it's five different articulation points that mm -hmm. it puts the arm through. So it's a much more rigorous test and there's no way to hide any, any accuracy issues that are inherent in the arm. Mm -hmm. and, and let's back up, because I, was, I, I meant to ask you this earlier. So when they say six axis and, and seven axis, sure. can you, because that refers to where, so you got like yeah. the shoulder, the elbow, I and mean, what are all the, <laughs> because I can't even come up with seven, I mean, where are they at? Sure, sure, so that, it has to do with all the different joints in the arm, there's a joint okay. at the base, one at the elbow. Um, so basically what you have with that seven axis is the rotation mm -hmm. of um, the final, what, the probe piece basically. So okay. the why you have seven axes, it just makes it more ergonomic, especially when you're laser scanning. Oh, okay. It right. makes it easier to, to uh, handle the laser scanner. Okay. Mm -hmm. So maybe, and maybe even get to, to yeah, uh, any angles stuff that, that you can't, wouldn't have get, get, get to with a, you know, five axes or six exactly. axes. Exactly. Okay. All right, okay, mm -hmm. got it. And this technology goes back, as we mentioned in the, the opening, to the 80s. I mean, this has been, yep. this, the, the general been arm, time, arm yeah. technology has been around for a long time. Uh, if you visit Pharaoh's uh, offices, you'll see kind of their wall of history there, <laughs> yeah. of all the, the different arms. I believe it started out in the, in the dental space. Yeah, the, so Pharaoh yeah. stands for Fraser and Rab Orthopedics. Mm -hmm. So um, their, their first products were geared towards the dental industry. How funny. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> kind of cool. Yeah, if you go, if you go, I think we've been yeah, there. Yeah, we've been there. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's a really cool facility. You see all the different <laughs> arms throughout the years, from the yeah. 80s until now. It's, it's pretty, pretty cool stuff. All right, well, let's take a look at the next question. Let's see. Uh, I'll take this one. Okay. So does it come calibrated, ready to measure, right out of the box? 
Right, so uh, like we got into before, you're going to want to calibrate your probe and your laser. Um, again, the probes, the new probes that come with the Quantum, you calibrate mm -hmm. them once and then those will be ready to measure. And uh, calibration takes a, a few minutes, um, very simple process, it comes with the calibration cone. Everything you mm -hmm. need is included with the system. Um, and again, those NIST traceable certifications are, are available once a year and, and as long as you maintain your warranty. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a pretty much plug and play system. And how often does the, how often does the does the arm itself need to be calibrated? Uh, we recommend once a year. And um, is something you can do, or do you send it back to Faro? Uh, we recommend sending it back to Faro, but okay. usually there are local um, local operations that will calibrate that can do it. Okay. That can calibrate your arm. But uh, Faro's is NIST traceable, so okay. that's uh, something to keep in mind if that's what your company is looking for. So okay. and that, and again, ISO ten three sixty. Yes. That the, is that the the standard we're talking about here? And when when was that standard? When it, did that come out? Two thousand sixteen. Okay. Oh, so, so it's very just, very recent. Just a recent standard. Mm -hmm. And the B eighty nine. We said it's been around oh, for a while. Yeah, B eighty nine's been around forever. I, I think B eighty nine was originally a CMM. Okay. was for regular CMMs, and so uh -huh. it's been around since, yeah, beginning of time, I think. So and somebody will correct me on that, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right, it's QDL, uh, call it out to come, let us know if we're, if, we're, <laughs> if we're wrong on that. But, uh, but yeah, so, but, so before that, there wasn't, well, there wasn't really even an understanding. I mean, B89 goes back to the dawn of, of this technology, is that correct? That when you say the beginning of time. Uh, well, I think B89, and I'm really gonna get myself in deep water here. Just, uh, yeah. I believe B89, you can correct us on this, B89, I believe, is a stand that goes back to Kind of the beginning or early days of CMMs, regular oh, wow. CMMs. Okay. okay. Yeah, not not anything to do with portable arms. It got it was kind of adapted, so to speak. I think if I'm getting this right, to kind of encompass portable measuring equipment. But it was really designed, I believe, for. <laughs> um, notice all my little uh, wiggle wobble <laughs> words here. I believe the 89 was for traditional, you know. Uh, fixed CMMs. Which I believe goes back to the 60s? In the, in the earlier than that, yeah. 50s, wow. Yeah, yeah. That's amazing that technology's yeah. been around that long. Before we say any more, let's shut let's, up. Let's move on <laughs> to the next question. That's Boy, right. you guys well. are really <laughs> off <our head. laughs> Right. We only uh, pretend uh, we know what we're doing uh, on television. Uh, okay. All right. Uh, you've indicated that the Quantum S is very rugged. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah. Yeah, so before we ship out every arm, um, it goes through a series of uh, ruggedness tests. So we do temperature cycling from negative five degrees Fahrenheit all the way up to 140, which should cover the vast majority of operating temperatures, I imagine. Okay. Um, we also do a vibration shake test, right? So we just shake the arm for a while, uh, make it dance, right? <laughs> um, then we do a, a drop test. We drop it at least four times in the case, mm -hmm. um, and then we do a recalibration and make sure it's measuring within standard after all those tests. So mm -hmm. again, this has been uh, battle tested and proven to withstand anything you're gonna throw at it. Yeah, I mean, we should, you mentioned in the case, because we, gotta, we, we should say that this is stuff that peop it's intended to be shipped and carried and yeah. put in the luggage on a plane and, and that sort of stuff, right? Correct, yeah, yeah. the arm comes yeah. in a Pelican case and uh, we ship it through, through various vendors, FedEx and, you know, mm -hmm. It's, it's built to withstand those uh, those different conditions. Okay. Yeah. And there's a lot of, obviously, when they get to the customer, I mean, there's all these different applications and, right. and the shop floor. I mean, so what are some of the, I mean, what are some of the real world applications in which that ruggedness would really come into play? Right, uh, right on the machine floor, you're in process inspection. Mm -hmm. You know, you have a lot of vibrations going on. Sure. Um, sometimes people might walk by and drop the arm, something like that, God forbid, right? But right. It's, it's, it's real world scenarios and the, the arm is built to withstand those, those scenarios. Mm -hmm. okay. Great, cool. Um, so I think we do have a few more questions actually, still, still coming in, that's great. And, and hey, before we even prog progress any further, uh, again, Guess what? QDL at qualitydigest.com is a place you can send your questions. We're gonna have Raphael for about another uh, another seven minutes or so, eight minutes. So if you do have questions, please get them in now and we'll we'll try to get them in at the end of the segment. We, we missed a question with uh, Eric Perkins <laughs> earlier in the show. But we'll, 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 we'll get him to respond what, to you what, offline yeah, on that. Well, we wanna to, want to make sure we don't miss the next okay. one. So again, QDL at qualitydigest.com, uh, at Twitter at qualitydigest, or just, just chat to us with, with your questions. So let's take a look at the, the next one we do have here queued up. Uh, okay, can you confirm the accuracy of uh, .0013 inches for hard tip and .0019 inches for the laser? What about touch probes? Hmm, good technical um, question. Can we throw that one back up there? Yeah, there um, we go, okay, cool. Yeah, so again, that accuracy is uh, spec'd out to that new ISO standard. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and you can use you can confirm this on your own with uh, a gauge block, mm -hmm. if you will. You know, sure. see, we measured that a few times, and you know, in real, once you get your arm, you can verify that it's within spec, um, and that's the volumetric accuracy, right? So that's moving the arm through its entire range of motion. Um, so I'm not too sure. So touch probes. So they were talking. The, the, I think because like I, I believe probes. you said in the I believe you said in the video your accuracy was. Uh, 
one point three thousandths for sure. touch probe and one point nine for okay. the laser scanner, right? Right. I think I think just I, I think they're just saying uh, mm. how do you confirm mm. that? Which I believe you just yeah. yeah. I mean, that's so your, your calibration. The calibration is NIST traceable. Right. So yeah. Yeah, and, and to speak to the calibration of the laser specifically to get that number, we, we measure a sphere of a known size five diff within five different articulation points, and that's how we come up with that number. And these numbers are worst case scenario. If, if you're with proper technique, you'll see even better accuracy, accuracy, sorry, accuracy results in your real process inspection. Mm -hmm. Okay. Cool. And the quantum SR, I mean, and now that's that's pretty much brand new, right? I mean, how, yeah. how long has it been out? A few weeks now. A few weeks. Yeah, wow. okay. yeah, very, so very is, new. This is one of the first demos anybody's ever seen of this of this product. Yeah, yeah. And so what the other the prior generations, I know we kind of went through this on the video, but the prior generations, the the upgrade that that went into this. Sure. Um, so what what were some of the changes and the upgrades that that actually you saw on, on the sure. Quantum so so the previous arm was a Ferro Edge, and that came out mm -hmm. seven years ago. So and you know how technology progresses sure, so much years, nowadays. Yeah. Um, but there's been a 25% reduction in the weight, so it's mm. a lot more ergonomic. It feels like it's an extension of your arm, whereas the previous arm could get a little fatiguing. Um, not to say it was it was hard to handle sure, or anything, sure. but that's just one of the advancements. Yeah. As well as a, a bump in accuracy, and um, as well as data capture for the laser scanner. Uh, we're able to capture laser data five times as fast as before. Yeah. So um, again, there's lighter. There's also shock absorbers in the uh, in the arm for setup. Um, so that that lightness really helps with the with the portability, which Ferro is all about. Um, we're not trying to replace your CMM. We want to work with your CMM, right. with your right. current imp inspection process. Okay, cool. I believe uh, I believe we have another question. Yeah, one more queued up. We'll take a look here. Uh, if 3D volume accuracy is 1.3 thousandths and 1.9 thousandths, uh, hard tip and laser respectively, what about measuring flatness or concentric features? Hmm. So, um, basically, the, all that is calculated in, in your software, right? And the, the arm works with a variety of software. So, uh, each point that you measure with the hard probe or with the laser will be within the specs that we, we, we state, right? The 1.9, the 1.3 mm -hmm. um, thousandths. And, and I, then think, I think what, what may be getting confusing here, and correct me if I'm wrong, I think when, <laughs> when you're talking about a traditional CMM and sure. you're measuring just, so they have kind of, there were two different specs. There used to be a volumetric accuracy, okay. and then I'm not sure whether a point accuracy. Sure. Because you would have maybe only move one stage. You'd move it, oh, only one axis would move. Okay. Right? But with an arm, all of the axes are always Correct. moving, so it's always basically volumetric accuracy, I right. think. <laughs> I mean, it, yeah. that's all it's doing is volumetric accuracy. Yeah. yeah, it's measuring in 3D space, right? So that flatness that you get a call out of, it's going to be based on the um, the average of those points that right. build your features, um, and that'll speak to how what flatness reading you'll get and then what, what concentricity measurements you can get. Okay. Right. And any inaccurate information that I give is totally quality digest and not <laughs> ferals or sterets. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for doing that, Derek. Appreciate that. Um, I, I think we do have one more. Yes, we do. Okay. okay. They're coming in good. And, and please keep on sending them. Um, all right. Uh, Sir Rafael, you mentioned the blue laser a lot. Specifically, why is a blue laser better than other colors? Good, good question. Because they're all actually green and, and, red, and red. Red. Yeah. 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 So that, that's a great question. So with the blue, let's say compared to a red wavelength uh, mm -hmm. scanner, the blue has a shorter wavelength. So what that allows is um, reduced speckle, um, greater detail capture, and as well as one of the greatest benefits is you can scan shiny and chrome surfaces without the need of any sprays or any kind of coating, powder coating to, mm -hmm. to get that. So, uh, so that basically, um, improves your 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 scanning rates, um, and it, it it allows. Sorry, <laughs> so it, it lets you basically capture the data a lot faster mm -hmm. in in the process. All right, cool. cool. And I think uh, do we hear we? Oh, we don't no, have any more. No, no more. Great. Okay. Well, that's great. Well, uh, Raphael, I mean, I think that was a, a really good look at the Quantum S uh, far, from Faro, the yeah. uh, the scan arm. Uh, uh, what, one of the, one of, where, where are you seeing? Where are you seeing this mostly? Use where is the interest in this product from what you're seeing? Uh, shop floor, CNC shops. I mean, where, where, where is this? Yeah, I've seen it all over the place. The, the with the hard probe, you see it a lot in inspection. With okay. the laser scanner, you see a lot of reverse engineering applications. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so in a wide variety of industries, but um, manufacturing is where it, where it stems from. So it still has a very high pre um, presence in the manufacturing world. So any kind of uh, in, like I said, in process inspection, first articles inspections, um, those are those are where one of the biggest industries that you'll see the arm in. Perfect. Well, thanks, Raphael. That's yeah. great. That's great. Well, thank you for being here, Raphael. Sorry we had to miss Mike Koski, but you guys did a great yeah. demo. 
uh, again, of the, uh, the Quantum S scan arm from Faro Technologies right there. And uh, again, if we missed your question, or if you're still getting questions in like we had on our last segment, um, we will definitely be forwarding, forwarding them well, on actually, to- Well, actually, will be here at the end of the show. He so will if be, that's If they're true. related to the arm, we'll still be able to get we back We can still to get them on. Yeah. So yeah, keep on getting those questions in. It's, a, it's yeah. a really good to have that kind of interaction yeah. with, uh, with the team here. So right. if you have questions, send it in. Again, Quality Digest, uh, qdlqualitydigest.com. Uh, at Twitter at Quality Digest or uh, just chat them out to us. All right, well, we are at the end of this segment of our Excel. Before we move on, of course, we want to thank our sponsor, Farrah Technologies. Farrah Technologies is the world's most trusted source for 3D measurement and imaging solutions. Farrah hopes you enjoyed uh, learning about their new Quantum S scan arm, which we just looked at here with Raphael. Uh, ask Farrah to set up a customized demo for you because you've got to give the Quantum S a try. And Farrah is the measure of success. So, for more information, Visit online at www.faro.com. All right, thanks again, Raphael. All right, well, we're gonna move on now uh, to our next segment because it is uh, Manufacturing Day today. And uh, uh, Dirk, it's uh, an interesting day, Manufacturing Day. A lot going on in Manufacturing Day across the country. Yep, yep, today is Manufacturing Day. It's an annual celebration of modern manufacturing during which manufacturers invite their communities, including students and educators, business people, media, and politicians, in order to educate visitors about manufacturing career opportunities and improve really the public perceptions of manufacturing. Uh, because as we all know, uh, we've talked about here a lot, sometimes manufacturing gets kind of a bad rap. The, the, right. the dirty fingernail thing. Exactly. Well, Manufacturing <laughs> Day is produced by the National Association of Manufacturers, NAM, with contributors and support from the Hollings Manufacturing Extension Partnership, or MEP which is a program within NIST. Now, talking to Gordon Stiles earlier, he pointed out the importance of building up interest in manufacturing in the next generation, the need to change the perception of what manufacturing is, is really all about. And one of the things that happens on Manufacturing Day is that manufacturers across the country open their doors to the public so that they can see what is really going on. What's manufacturing really ab all about? That's right. One of those companies, Transfer Flow, is just down the street from our studio. They are. And we are really excited to have them join us via Skype. Uh, with us now via Skype is Robert Green, who is the Director of Marketing at Transfer Flow. Hi, Robert. Hey, guys. How are you? All right. All right. Pretty good. How are so you? Robert is, is uh, broadcasting to us live from his phone. <laughs> so, <laughs> hey, Robert, why don't you tell us a little bit about who Transfer Flow is and uh, what does you guys make anyway? Sure. So we are the lead in the manufacture of fuel tank systems. So we will do about half of our business is aftermarket. So the end user, uh, driver usually of a heavy duty truck that needs more driving range and fuel capacity. And then the other half of our business is OEM work. So we are a QVM supplier to Ford Motor Company. We supply U-Haul, Multiquip, Naphtide, a lot of the uh, OEMs and uh, vehicle outfitters with their fuel system needs as well. And I, and I see you've got some people milling, or milling around there a little bit. Uh, can you may, maybe show us around your plant a little bit? Yeah, definitely. So we're, we're super excited as a U.S. manufacturer. Uh, you know, it's part of our company values that uh, we acknowledge our contribution to our customers, to our employees, our local community, and really to our country. We believe that uh, U.S. manufacturing is very important from an economic and, and on many other levels as well. So today is a really special day for us where we get to open up the facility to the public and kind of show what we do and really kind of advocate for U.S. manufacturing. Uh, one of the things that I'll tell you about our company is that our founder, who was a former GM engineer, founded this company some 35 years ago and is now heavily uh, involved in education, trying to change curriculum at the high school level to prepare uh, our workforce for jobs of the economy of the future um, so that those skills don't have to be taught at trade schools or in college but instead can be uh, pushed down to high school and even uh, middle school. So what you see behind me is our uh, manufacturing facility. Uh, behind me I have a Haas vertical milling machine. Hopefully you can see that pretty well. I also have a Cincinnati laser. Let me articulate my camera a little bit better. I'll show you a very cool piece of equipment. We just upgraded uh, to a new Cincinnati laser where the previous model was capable of cutting some 300 inches in a minute. This new one is driven by uh, fiber optics and can cut up to a thousand inches per minute. Whoa. Uh, hold it up here appropriately, you'll see we're cutting out some little uh, keychains. 
Uh, but this thing will really fly. We're doing a lot of detailed small cuts. I'll show you what one of those parts looks like real quick. Show you how small and repeatable we can get these things down to. Wow. Wow. Uh, but we'll, we'll use this to cut out all of our sheet metal um, for our fuel tanks. And then uh, the next operation is to take it over to the press brake, which you'll see we have several press brakes back here. We'll form those up. And then uh, they get staged in this area here on these racks. Because we have an open house, it's not as big as a couple behind me where our hand welders will do some packing. And then, if I turn over here, I will show you one of our four uh, robot welders. So we're not doing a lot of hand welding anymore. Instead, we took those uh, welders and we trained them to run these uh, robot welding machines from Lincoln. And that's how uh, all of our things are put together now. So here I know you guys are focused uh, quite a bit on quality, so we have a lot of regulatory considerations uh, from the Department of Transportation, uh, the Air Resource Board under the EPA, and we'll do, of course we have to have an ISO 9000 compliant quality system, we'll deal with the old uh, ISO TS 16949, I think you guys can correct me, I think that standard name has probably changed. Yep. Is that right? Yeah, I thought so. Um, and then we'll do a whole lot of testing just to ensure quality here. We're really the premier manufacturing in this segment. Uh, so it's really important to us that we have premium quality in all of our parts. So we'll have a little bit of a lot of things. And uh, Robert, you're breaking up a little bit, but we're, we're, catching, we're catching most of what you're saying there. And yes, uh, it's... Uh, if memory serves, Dirk, it's IATF 6949, I believe now. Right, right, the, the exactly, correct, yeah. Yes. yeah, IATF. Yeah, I'm right. definitely losing you as well. Uh, <laughs> live, live broadcasting over the internet. Yeah. I'll get back where maybe I have a better signal. <laughs> well, but, it's, uh, you know, it's live, it's live TV. We <laughs> wanted to have a drop in for what you guys are doing. So Robert, maybe you can tell us because, you know, we, we actually have covered you guys in the past for Manufacturing Day. Um, how, did, how did Transfer Flow get involved in, in Manufacturing Day uh, over the years? Well, like I said, I mean, it's really born out of our values. We're a family-owned, second-generation company uh, that really is very patriotic at its core and really believes that uh, it's good for America where there's a very strong manufacturing base here in the country. And like I said, our founder has now moved on to be less uh, involved in the company and instead has put together a consortium called Grow Manufacturing, which is a consortium of many manufacturers that are really trying to influence education in order to support manufacturers needs I and mean, we have a hard time staffing uh, certain operations here which absolutely could be taught at the high school level uh, but instead very often we have to go to college graduates and trade school graduates just because that curriculum isn't really industry's need so that's one of the areas that we try to influence again it's good for our company it's good for uh, our segment uh, as a U.S. manufacturer, but it's really good for our country. So manufacturing day just allows us to put on display what we do and our values at work. And so the, the public who in this area may not be intimately familiar with exactly what we produce. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 I, it, basically what you said is that manufacturing day basically fits the ethos of, of transfer flow. I mean, it, it, it kind of it sounds like a natural fit for Absolutely. you guys. Yeah, it really, it really is. And we're, you know, we're, we're, uh, we're heavily, you can see throughout the facility, we're heavily invested in innovation and technology to drive efficiency through automation. But just to kind of let you know what transfer flow is all about, one of the things that's very cool about this company is we've never lost uh, an employee to automation. Instead, those employees, uh, when their job gets replaced, uh, if it does, by technology, they're taught to, to work that technology. And so we're kind of, I think, drawing a balance between the best of both worlds, which is embrace technology for efficiency gains, uh, but do it in such a way that you're actually supporting the growth of more American jobs. Well, Robert Green, that, that's so great. Thank you for, for joining us today and giving us a little taste of a Manufacturing Day yeah, event. Yeah, that's sure. uh, And people out there, you know, this is what's going on across the country today. There's thousands of, of plants and facilities across the U.S. doing an event just like that uh, down there at Transfer Flow. So, Robert Green, thanks again for joining us. 
on our, our virtual testing Thank measurement you. expo and, and being part of, of what's going on uh, there today. Um, I should also say you can visit Transfer Flow online. I believe it is transferflow.com, okay. correct? That's right. Thank you guys. Thanks for sharing us with your audience. Uh, you take care. We'll see you next year. Okay. Thank you, Robert. You, Robert. We'll, we'll, we'll see you later. Really, really good stuff there, yeah. Dirk. All right. Well, we're going to move on now to our, our next segment uh, on the show. And we've got a really good uh, additional demo for you coming up. So uh, let's move on to that next segment. This segment is brought to you by Sterrett Kinemetric. Sterrett Kinemetric designs and manufactures innovative precision, video-based, and optical comparator measurement systems. And joining us right now is Greg Mesh mm -hmm. of Sterrett. Hi, Greg. Thanks for joining us. Um, you know, I think most of our readers, and I want to set up this uh, uh, set up this next segment a little bit. We're going to be talking about a uh, what do you call it? a video? Uh, what, what do you? What's kind of the ger generic name for the product we're going to? Oh, it's like a machine vision system. A, a machine vision system. So most of our readers, uh, particularly if they've been in. Uh, in the industry for a long time, we're familiar with optical comparators or shadow mm -hmm. graphs, as they used to be mm -hmm. called back in the 40s. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, but th those have already changed quite a bit. I mean, it's kind of not your grandfather's optical comparator or shadow graph anymore. They're, they're usually vision ba based. And uh, kind of tell us uh, kind of what we can expect to see in today's modern optical comparator vision machine, vision measurement system. Yeah, exactly. The um it, it uses a lot of the same concepts in that you're still measuring the shadow of the part with the you know collimated backlight, um, but instead of using a mylar overlay with a tolerance band, right. you're, you're going to be using a software that can tell you where your edges are and measure all those things much more quickly and in a lot more various ways. Um, you know, and then all that data goes and goes to wherever you need it to be. Okay. Well, um, we did record yesterday with you a video clip of uh, the Flip HVR100. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, and we're going to run that in just a second. But just a reminder, if, if you've got quest questions about this type of equipment, send them to qdl at qualitydigest.com or tweet at qualitydigest or chat to us and do that now. So we get those questions <laughs> in when we come back in about, uh, I think, eight, nine minutes. That's right. So why don't we run that clip now? <laughs> so. Greg, we're going to look at the, the what this is the Flip HVR100, right? Correct. Okay, tell us about it. All right, yeah. So this is our new large field of view system. It's a bench top model, and uh, the the main features that it has is that it has a very large field of view, about 90 millimeters on the horizontal, and that it can either be in the vertical or the horizontal orientation. Okay. Meaning uh, you can you can right now we're seeing in the vertical. You're saying this can be laid down. Correct. Okay, yeah. All right, got it. Exactly. Okay. Um, uh, so show us what it does. Alrighty. So uh, let me put this part up here. And then if we look at the software, you can see this basically looks, it's a piston head. Okay. Um, and so the way that this unit works is, is that it can pick up the contrast between the light and the dark regions. So that's how it, it does its measurement algorithm. So if I go ahead and click that line there, you can see it sees that as a line. It sees that as a line. And then, you know, it'll auto recognize circles as well. Okay. Um, you can just click these. Click around, and it's basically as simple as that. If you want to do, you know, some fast and dirty type of measurements, you can just put a part up and start clicking on features. It'll and pick uh, up a radius as well, I'm assuming. Yeah, exactly. So you could grab this little arc right here, okay. um, and then you can make measurements between various features. So you could take, you know, basically these two circles here. See them on the right, and you can see them on the on the bottom here, okay. like that, and. Um, Another thing you can do is it, it typically goes to the center of features, but you can change that as well. So you can have it do the nearest points, the furthest points, and uh, it's simple to switch it between millimeters and inches as well. And w what kind of accuracy are we talking about? Uh, this is about eight microns worth of accuracy okay. um, and repeatability. All right. Yeah. Um, so that's a good example of you know how simple it is to just pick up any old part and measure it. Um, another thing that's very useful is basically the part recognition software. So what I'll show you now is um, if we go ahead and start a new program here, you can turn on the auto part functionality. And if you put a part on the stage, it should basically pick up that it's seeing something and measure it, just like so. Oh, wow. OK. so. You're saying that as long as, so it recognizes the part, the, the part shape. So as long as that, that part is in the library, 
that when you put a part down, it just detects the shape or the features or something and correlates it to that part stored in the library and just automatically brings up the, the parts program. Exactly. So based on the shape of the part alone, it can tell what it's looking at and run the program and basically measure whatever features you'd so, like. So this takes the place of, uh, typically in the past what you would have done is maybe brought up a menu of stored programs, gone through that, found the found the part you were looking for, selected that, and th this simply takes the place of that. It's just automatic. You just drop it on there. Exactly. It's great it, for the shop floor guy. <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah, so, yeah. so the they shop floor guy, they don't actually need time, to, yeah. yeah, they don't yeah. need to know how to find all those parts of where the libraries are. They don't even need to have access to that stuff. Okay. You can literally just, you know, put a part on there and measure it. Okay. So if, uh, I'll show you another part here. Um, this one's I noticed uh, you, you turn off the light. So sometimes, w when when might you use the, the, the top light here as opposed to just the... Uh, uh, the bottom one. Well, if you have um, a feature that's on the surface of the part, but it doesn't go all the way through, okay. that's when uh, that's when you'd want to be using your top light. In general, okay. we suggest you use the profile light. They okay. tend to be uh, a little bit more repeatable. Okay. Um, yeah. So here's another. Here's an example of a slightly more complex part okay. that we put on here, and it'll, that should also trigger the auto part recognition. And there you have it. So it doesn't even really care uh, about orientation. You just kind of pop it on there, and it's going to self-orient. Exactly. No matter yeah. which alignment you put on the uh, stage, it'll be okay. able to skew it and measure wow. your part regardless. <laughs> That's pretty cool. So yeah, you can put you know hundreds of parts in the library and have them all measure this way. Yeah. It's uh, very, very efficient. All right. Um, let's see. Another thing I'd like to show you is the um, basically its ability with round parts, because these ones pretty much that I've showed you have straight straight walls and straight edges. All right. Um, so here is an example of a, of a round part. And this is actually using a brand new module that our software guys at MetLogix just released. So this is a thread module. Um, and what this allows the program to do is to basically tell you, you know, your a bunch of information about the thread very quickly. Okay. So you use your thread tool here. And it's as simple as clicking and dragging over the thread. And then there you have it. Put it in millimeters since this is a metric wow, thread. That's <laughs> and there's your measurements for you. So All this is a thread wires and a micrometer. So <laughs> exactly. So this is a. Uh, it's a lot faster than that. So this is an M6 by one. So you can see there's your outside diameter. There's uh, you know almost six millimeters. There's your root diameter and your pitch diameter. Wow. And then here is your. Um, you know, there's your there, the pitch itself, which is one millimeter. Okay. Now I noticed that you're 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 changing. Uh, the, the, the height of this, I'm assuming that that's to focus on uh, parts depending how high, that, whether they're sitting right on top or in this case, what, two inches off the, exactly. off the base. Okay. So this, this system has a very large depth of field. It's okay. about a, an inch that it can measure within. Okay. Now, even outside of that depth of field, to the eye it'll look and focus. However, if you zoom in in the software, you can actually see, you know, the pixels here, okay. and then you can see your optical measurements. You can see it moving in and out of focus a little better. So if you wanted to really fine tune it, you could just zoom in and, and just... Exactly. Yeah, okay. So depending on you know how much accuracy you require, the best way to, to get your best focus is to do that. Okay. Um, yeah. So right. that's, that's a pretty good example of a round part. And then another functionality we have is the digital comparator function. So what this does is it allows you to use an overlay similar to a comparator, um, which is still very uh, very useful for certain shops. They, they prefer to have that overlay with the tolerance band on it. Right. And it's very simple to do so with this software. So what I'll do is, and you can see, you might be able to see it's a little bit out of focus now, but uh, we'll go ahead and move it into focus. And um, Next thing I'll do, so basically in order to get your overlay to snap onto the part correctly, you need to tell it the origin of the part. Um, so that's what I'll do here by setting up a datum and a skew. So we'll skew this top line here. We'll grab this left line here. And then where those two intersect is the datum of the part. Okay. And then basically what you do is you have a DXF of the nominal, you know, generated through CAD or what have you. Sure. Um, Go ahead and open that up, and it should just snap like like so. So okay. you can see there's an actual overlay here with the tolerance band on the part. Ah, okay. Now this could be set up to do uh, kind of no go, go no go, right? Where 
uh, it would compare to the tolerance bands, and if it's within or without, it would give you an indication of the part passed or failed. Exactly. So yeah. it'll uh, not even just the part passing or failing, but certain features within the part. Okay. And those features can also have different tolerances based on you know your needs for manufacturing. Okay. So you don't have just one tolerance band that that for all features, you each feature can be set up with its own tolerance. Exactly. Okay. So you can you can tolerance the features as necessary. Okay. Um, yeah, so that's you know a good example of this dysfunctionality. Okay. Um, and then finally, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about um, how you make this thing horizontal? <laughs> okay. Yeah. So it's rather simple. Basically, you got a little piece of bodywork here that needs to be removed, and then the stage here actually just flips 90 degrees like so. And then there's some rollers on the back that it just uses to pivot on, and there's a handle here on the top. And you just you know go ahead and lay it over backwards, and then uh, so for some people they uh, or some shops they they prefer to have that horizontal orientation, particularly for fixturing turn parts. A lot of times we see that a lot with our other horizontal systems. So we figured, hey, you know if we could offer a machine that offers both functionality in vertical and horizontal, and you know have it be price competitive with you know, a machine that does just one of those things, that we'd be in a very good place. Right, perfect. Uh, well, again, this was the, the Flip HVR100, right? Exactly, Okay, yes. perfect. Thanks for showing it to us. Hey, thank you very much for having me. Thanks, Greg. Uh, that was a that was a great demo. But bef uh, before we get to uh, the questions on that, we have we, some. We, we do in. have some coming mm -hmm. in. Yeah, yeah. We did have. I knew this was going to happen. <laughs> Somebody did have a comment about my B89. <laughs> Riff there for a while. I want to, let's, let's, I don't know what this says, but let's see what it says. Okay. Oh, well, that's oh. simple. Okay. And from our from our buddy Alan Metzel. I knew Alan would say something. B eighty nine committee formed in nineteen sixty three. So that so that was a ways back. So yeah, and you were saying that the that fixed CMMs were actually before that. So fixed we, CMMs been around came for on the a scene, long time. In, in and the then 40s, the committee committee formed because they said, hey, we need we, a, we a need standard about standard, this. Yeah, 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 to, yeah, to deal with that. Cool. Yeah, okay. Good. Excellent. I, I was afraid somebody's going to say you are a complete idiot. Well, that that you can read. <laughs> between the lines on that one, Dirk. But I mean, but Alan's thank, being nice to Thank you, you Alan. <laughs> we know Alan, I'm sure that's Alan Metzl. Thank sure you, Alan, Alan for, 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 for giving us that information. Now. Good All job. right, uh, so, we, so some real questions. Uh, what do we got for, for Greg here? Oh, okay. How asymmetric does a part need to be to assure proper automatic recognition and registration? Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know exactly how I'd give you a quantitative answer on how asymmetric it has to be. Um, but for the most part, even symmetric parts, I haven't had too much of an issue with the uh, auto part recognition. I haven't run into an issue where it wouldn't pick it up, um, okay. even doing something like a washer. Um, yeah, so as far as I know, the, the symmetry, it, it probably is somewhat important, but I, we haven't run into any problems in the field. And I think, you, I, I think also, you, I believe you told me in order to speed up the process, they went from something like Complete, you know, complete mapping of the part and trying to do it to some sort of mathematical. It sounded like some sort of mathematical analysis of the shape, and that's what they're they're doing right now, or something like that. Is that what you were? Yeah, as it was explained to me by uh, our software guys over at MetLogix, and they'll probably correct me if I'm wrong here, because uh, I don't necessarily understand exactly what they've done. But it's I know that instead of looking at all the points in the point cloud, they're looking for specific shapes on the part, mm -hmm. and that really speeds up the. Um, Basically, the search time that it takes. So it's when you see that little searching for patterns dialog there, that they cut that way down because mm -hmm. of that new uh, software development that just came out about a month ago. Mm. So that's, I, I, that's and I really gotta, nice. I got to believe that for the shop floor guys, this is actually pretty darn cool. Because I mean, like, I, th I think we mentioned it in, in, mm -hmm. in there. Is I mean, and I've seen people do that. Even if it's an automated machine, they've got to bring up a menu of all the parts. They search through the part. They click on the part. Maybe they click the part just above. Maybe they, right. they they misclick right, and it's like, oh, it's the wrong program. This you just plop it on there, and four seconds later, you've got your part program. Oh yeah, I would um, imagine <laughs> the throughput is much much higher yeah. just and, because and, and of fewer that. errors. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, way fewer errors. You don't actually need to know what the programs are. You don't even need to you know navigate to any kind of folders. Yeah. As long as it's programmed in there, it'll stick and it'll it'll just find it for you. Mm -hmm. It's really really easy that way. Ah, cool. And this again, this is a brand new product, right? I mean, this is just out in the last what a couple of months. Oh uh, yeah, I mean, it's this. These are really that was a pre-production unit wow. where uh, I believe at the uh, quality show here in a couple of weeks. That's where we're going to really launch it. So you mm. guys are really seeing the first demo <laughs> of that product. <laughs> that was literally the first demo we've done. I I built that machine myself 
last week. So oh, it was. Cool. Well, yeah. I'm glad we're seeing it here before quality. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> See it here first. That's <laughs> See right. <it> first. <laughs> yeah. Good job. Thanks. All right. All right. Well, let's let's take a look at the next question here and see what else we, we have for you. Um, okay, Starrett produces a wide variety of video measurement systems. So what sets this one apart from the competition? Good question. Yeah, great question. And I think um, really what it is, is the first of all, the very, very large field of view in a very small package. Mm -hmm. This actually has the largest field of view of any of our systems, including the large, huge floor sanding mm -hmm. unit. Um, but it also has the ability to flip in a horizontal or vertical position, which those are really sort of what differentiates our product lines traditionally, is what, you know, which way do you want to fixture your parts? Do you want to do it horizontal? Do you want to do it vertical? Once they figure that out, we kind of go from there. Now, why, why would you want, why would, what's the advantage of being able to flip it horizontally rather than, I mean, I would think it's going to do the same thing either way, right? It's, it will, exactly. It will actually do the same thing either way. It sort of depends on the kind of parts that you're going to use. If you have parts that need a lot of fixturing, a lot of times the horizontal position is a lot easier because you just have, there's sort of more room to work there. It doesn't okay. have to sit on the glass. Um, whereas if you're using small parts that are going to fit entirely in the field of view, um, a lot of times a vertical orientation is easier oh, just because, because you, you can just plop it, plop on, the it on the glass and okay. off it goes. Well, gently set it on the glass. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. don't drop it. Right? <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, okay. uh, I think we have some more questions coming mm -hmm. in. Uh, oh, okay, I'm not sure we talked about that. Um, data export options for the software. So, you know, most, almost all sub, you know, suppliers and customers usually want to mm -hmm. have some sort of inspection report. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So the, um, what's really nice about this software is that you can actually put that as part of the program. So that automatic inspection procedure that I just showed run, you can have it generate a report either a CSV or an Excel file or a text file. It'll export those to whatever, wherever you want them to go automatically. You don't even have to run a report. You just put the part on and as part of that automatic program, it just sends the report without the user even having to think about it. So. There's a lot of different ways. It can also do DXFs. So if you want to see an actual drawing oh, of okay. what it measured, you can do that as well. Are, are the reports uh, customizable? Put your logo on them, mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff? Oh, okay. yeah. You can you can customize the reports. You can get them. Uh, there's a lot of things you can do with those. Okay. Um, I'm not an expert in how to do that, but I've seen okay. some pretty cool mm -hmm. stuff done that okay. way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Modify it specifically for your for your For, for your organization. Yeah, for, your yeah. organization, for, for the right kind here. of the company that's, that's working with that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Cool. Uh, all right. Let's look at the next question here. Um, Okay, what size workpiece can this product accommodate? Um, what, what, what are the, what's the capacity in terms of different larger or small pieces that you can accommodate? I believe weight-wise, you're probably going to look at right around 20 pounds mm -hmm. for the uh, system. As far as size goes, um, you're, it's, the whole part doesn't have to fit in the field of view, mm -hmm. but whatever features you want to measure do. So you might have a larger part that has a feature that you want to measure mm -hmm. on there. Of course, you know if you have features that are too far apart, you're not going to have the Oh. the distance between them because mm -hmm. it only has the field of view measurements. However, you know, because it has such a large field of view in the first place, a lot of parts are just going to be able to, you're going to see the whole thing and you don't have to go around and look for each feature the way you would with a more, you know, traditional system with a zoom lens, moving around, doing all the features individually. It's just going to take one shot of the whole thing and give you your whole report all at once. Mm -hmm. so. And I, I think you touched on this, um, backing up a little bit, I think you touched on this a little bit in the video is, uh, um, Depth, depth of field and, mm -hmm. and focus. And so tell us a little bit about, more about that because I saw you adjusting the head in order to do focus, but I wasn't seeing hardly any change until you really zoomed in. I wasn't really seeing that much of a change from my naked eye. Right. On it. So how important is it um, to get this thing exactly focused given that I think you said this thing has a huge depth of field? Yeah, it's got a very large depth of field of about uh, 25 millimeters. Okay. Um, so it is. That was actually a problem for us in engineering when we were looking at this lens, moving it up and down. We were, you know, we weren't <laughs> seeing the difference. We were like, okay, where are we actually working at? So we originally were using like basically a ruler to make sure that we're at the right working mm. distance. But then what we noticed is if you just scroll in with the scroll wheel or you know pinch zoom on the on the actual image on the screen, you'll start to see those pixels themselves. Okay. And once you can see those, it's actually a lot easier to zoom it. Um, but it is very important to get it within that 25 millimeters depth of field for accuracy okay. purposes. It'll it'll drop off pretty dramatically outside of once that. Once you get outside of yeah. that, because the edge the edge isn't is, is defined, so it doesn't really know where the edge is on on, on the part. Exactly, the yeah. algorithm okay. does will not be able to interpret it as accurately as possible. Okay. Now I notice um, 
you also had the capability to top light. Mm -hmm. uh, part, where would you where would you use that as opposed to just strictly doing uh, a, a shadow? Well, anytime that you're going to have a, you know basically something cut in into a profile, but it doesn't go all the way through the part. Okay. Like let's say you just have you know something milled onto the surface, but it's not a through hole. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's uh, that's typically where you'd see that used. Oh, so and, but you, the same tools would work except now now rather than clicking on the edge of a of a shadow, you're actually clicking on the edge of a feature that's mm -hmm. being lit. Exactly. Uh, have that basically. So yeah, and that becomes a little bit challenging just because the the algorithm runs using contrast. So it's okay. looking for a change in con in in light value. Okay. So you got you do have to do a little bit of work to make sure you're getting the contrast that you need, but there's some tools in the software that'll make that easier as well. There's a, a an edge teach so you can tell it specifically what kind of contrast by basically clicking and holding on a point and it'll say, "Okay, that's the contrast level we're looking for." And that'll make it much, much more accurate. And that's, okay. that's typically when I do applications for customers. I'll, you know, you see that quite a bit. Okay. So what, what, um, what piece of equipment is this generally replacing? What, what steroid equipment is this replacing? And why was this, the features of this mm -hmm. product uh, so valuable for the customers that you were hearing from? What, what are they looking for that this really addresses? I believe it's, uh, I mean, the obvious thing that would be replacing is probably an optical comparator mm -hmm. or possibly even another type of vision system mm -hmm. um, depending on what they have. Uh, the the very large field of view, that's really the benefit of this specific system and it's compact size. The, the fact that you could put these, you know, it's a bench top model, you don't mm -hmm. have to dedicate a whole bunch of floor space for it. Um, yeah, and its ability to be in either position. Mm -hmm. Really give it a lot of versatility, so it could, you know, it could replace a vertical type of machine. It could replace a comparator. It could replace, um, you know, or work alongside those as well. Mm -hmm. It's just, you know, it's sort of. It'll be interesting to see where what industries demand this the most um, right. here shortly. So, All right. cool, cool. Uh, so we have another question. We have another one. <coughs> how many? Oh, how many parts at one Ooh. time can it handle? Oh, that's a good one. Yeah. Yeah. So actually, there with that part recognition playback. It can do multiple parts in the field of view. So if you have more than one part with patterns, it can actually go through and look at all of those and give you reports on each of them. Mm -hmm. um, how many it can handle, I would, I want to say, and I'm, I'm not entirely sure because I haven't talked to our software guys about this specifically, but I want to say it's probably realistically around 10, mm, okay. just because of the size of the field of view. And if you have parts that are too much smaller, you know, there there is a limitation on the size of the part. Like, you don't want to be measuring something that's a millimeter across right. with that machine just because you don't have enough pixels to get really good right, data. Right, right, yeah. um, so I'd say realistically, somewhere between ten to fifteen parts would be what you could expect. And and um, and just, uh, I'm not sure I understood the question. Are they talking about if you put multiple different parts on the stage? Is 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 that is that what they're talking about? Is how many parts at, at one mm -hmm. time can you measure? So it'll actually, if you have, if you enable multiple part in the field of view playback, you can have multiple copies of the same part of the in same the field part, of view. The in the field okay, of view, okay. and it may in fact do m different parts. I'm not sure about that. I know okay, that yeah. the software guys were looking at doing that. Okay. Um, I've never seen that happen, but I know for sure that you can put multiples of the same part as long as they all fit in the field of view and then fire. Basically, fire the you know the measurement trigger and tell it, okay, here it is, and it'll tell you here's all the reports for all of them. Mm -hmm. Pretty cool. <laughs> so yeah, that's, that's nice. pretty cool. That's, that's pretty cool. cool. Uh, let's see uh, another question here. Uh, will the video be available for vendors to show to customers after this event is complete? Uh, I, well, that one's for us. Okay. For sure. uh, so the answer is uh, yes, yes. This is going to be the entire. The entire episode, uh, the entire show, show that you the two, whole thing two you've plus seen, hours, we're almost at two hours already. Will be will be on YouTube, but yeah. individual segments, I imagine, as well. We, we will as well, yeah, yeah. Um, and you'll be able to uh, to check it out. We'll have an article coming out recapping the show uh, right. early next week, so you'll be able to check that out, and you'll be able to uh, to click on the individual pieces of the show and, and check that out also. Okay. So yeah, look out for that, and uh, yeah, it, it's uh, like I say, it's been. It, I think it's been a great show. We've enjoyed having it. So <laughs> yeah, I think that you, hopefully any of you who missed it will be able. To, to catch it uh, on, on the rebound uh, All right. starting next week. All right. uh, oh, what software is included and in ease of use? Ease of use. Yeah. So yeah, I think that video pretty well demonstrates how, how simple it is to use, and it's very, and very intuitive. And the name of that software again was? Uh, the software is actually uh, M3 by M3 Metlogic, by so Metlogic. M3 right. version 2 is yeah. the, the current version of it. Um, and yeah, we, we've, we really like that software. Mm. Our customers really enjoy using that software. That's probably on 
you know, the vast majority of our machines that go out. Well, it looked like that. it was all just, you know, click on a feature and it recognizes the feature mm -hmm. and, oh, this is, mm -hmm. this is an arc, this is a circle, this is a line. I mean, it oh, seems yeah. pretty, pretty point and shoot. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Although that's not to, you know, say that there's actually a lot of features in there that power users can use okay. that get way more in-depth than we really want to go into here. But right. there's, uh, it's got both, you know, the, the ease of use for somebody just getting into it and also yeah. a lot of... We have some really wild customers who are doing things measuring knees, mm -hmm. um, like knee replacements. Oh, like, yeah, right, right. So yeah, they have, nice. it, yep. you know, they have it set up with rotaries and all different axes, Neesh. and they're looking at profiles and all different, you know, angles and things. Give yeah, somebody a new toy, and mm -hmm. they'll figure out a, a way. way to, <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> feel out a way to t tweak it. Yeah. Well, that's what I'm saying. You you had mentioned that you're, you know, this is so new that you're going to be going out in the field and you're going to be finding applications mm -hmm. and people are going to be, you know, customers that you know are going to be using this in all sorts of interesting ways. What, oh, what yeah. do you foresee? What do you foresee some of those applications that you think are going to be the most common that people will use? I think a lot of it will be, you know, anytime you have a part that's going to require 100% inspection mm -hmm. of like a smaller part that would fit in that field of view, mm -hmm. um, any any shop who's making a lot of those kind of parts, I think it would be extremely valuable because you can have them pre-programmed, mm -hmm. you can throw them on the stage, have it measure them, you know, gives you a report, pass, fail, mm -hmm. throw it in the respective bin, and you know, you're off and running for mm -hmm. every single part. and. It, Literally in seconds. Yeah. So. Well, yeah, almost almost walk away. I mean, I could see if you were measuring the same part mm -hmm. and you already had your fo uh, your focus set up. Yep. You set a part on there. You step aside. You grab another part. By the time mm -hmm. you're ready, that one's done. Pull it. I mean, you could sit there just have yeah. somebody just keep feeding the parts and it's going to measure it because it's going to re recognize the yeah. the part. And I think that's the other thing about about that auto recognition mm -hmm. is that you could just keep. Just as quick as you can put them on and mm -hmm. it take its re make its report, you can feed it. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And that's, uh, you know, I think that's one of its biggest strengths is its yeah. ability to do that. Okay. Um, yeah, I would, I would like to see a lot more people use that functionality that way. Mm. Um, yeah. Yep. All so right. a medical device would be one and, and a few other uh, um, applications like that, a few other sectors oh, like yeah, that. Oh, yeah, absolutely. A medical device, we do some work with aerospace, mm -hmm. um, defense contractors. Mm -hmm. Those guys, we see a lot of a uh, lot of business from those industries. Mm -hmm. So, okay, but yeah, cool. medical industry for sure. Right looks on. like we have a looks like another question up there. Question. Let me take this one. Uh, when the part is measured, as you are able to generate reports such as typical CM. When the part is measured, are you able to generate reports such as uh, typical CMMs? What kind of tolerance or resolution can you achieve? Amazing product, by the way. And a little kudos for you guys on that one. <laughs> hey, thanks, guys. Thanks. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. So, as far as um, let's see the. The, uh, we absolutely can generate a report. Um, like I was saying, it'll do a CSV, text file, mm -hmm. DXF. You can ha customize those reports as well. Um, so that's, that's very simple. And as far as uh, the accuracy for the tolerances, the, uh, the accuracy that we're seeing is about eight or nine microns mm. uh, with that machine right now uh, for both flat, round, and square-sided you know, parts. Um, I think that that's actually right about at the theoretical limit of mm. the, the size of lens that we're using and okay. the pixel density of the sensor, along with the, the capabilities of the algorithm to, uh, to basically sub-pixel interpret those edges. Mm. Because one pixel is about 37 microns, but the, uh, the software can actually sub-pixel and interpolate that down. Right, right, yeah. So yeah. we're right at the theoretical limits as mm. far as our hardware and software are, are concerned okay. there. Oh, cool, cool. Um, one more question. Oh, what is the field of view and what are the capabilities of this unit? So yeah, like I was saying, the field of view is, it's very large, it's about 90 millimeters horizontally. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so 3.65 inches I believe that is. Okay. And uh, like I said, the capabilities are sort of what we've been showing as yeah. far as uh, the auto part recognition, the uh, top light, bottom light, you know, multiple different ways to fixture. Uh, yeah, I think okay. that that's uh, that pretty much covers it. And mm -hmm. have you ever have you ever? Uh, <laughs> this is one thing I'm always interested in. So we we talked about just the old standard optical comparators, mm -hmm. you know, that've mm -hmm. been around forever. Have you ever brought one of these newer comparators or? vision systems into a shop that's been using an optical comparator and are, are the old timers kind of like what is this newfangled equipment and and not really do they get into like the whole digital aspect of it as opposed to like you said having to lay a mylar over a screen and and do it that way so yeah we've had a varying 
<laughs> responses from those kind of guys. Some of them are really into it. They, you know, they really take it and run with it mm -hmm. and understand the value. Some of them are kind of set in their ways and they don't, we've had people say, oh, you know, this machine doesn't work correctly. And it's just basically because they don't want to, they don't want to get out of doing yeah. what they've been doing. Yeah. Um, but we've had good luck. Usually with a little bit of training, a little bit of showing them the benefits of mm -hmm. it, they, uh, they, they almost always come around and they, they enjoy all the benefits that, that we have. Um, I mean, really, quite a few of our systems are built into literal optical comparator chassis. Because mm, okay. we also still sell those. Mm, right. We sell optical comparators at our location. <laughs> right, right, So, right, yeah. you know, that still is part of our business for us. We still... Well, that's right. So we don't want to badmouth optical yeah. comparators. <laughs> no, yeah. Stare at me optical great <laughs> optical comparators. <laughs> that we do. Um, yeah, so the, there still is a place for those for sure. And also, you know, obviously this is for a smaller volume. I mean, some optical comparators, I mean, Starrett makes them, which oh, are yeah. gargantuan. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. We we Our largest optical comparators outsize our largest vision system by, you know, <laughs> many multiple times. Right, right. They're, they're very big. Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, I think that's it for our questions. Um, we're we're going to move on. That's it for the segment. Um, of course, we'd like to again acknowledge our sponsor before we do move on, um, and that's uh, Starikin Metric. Starikin Metric brings you the HVR100, the latest example of Starit product design and engineering. The HVR100 presents users with new solutions for increased productivity and decreased costs. Starit equipment features modern, sleek designs and powerful yet user-friendly software. From application analysis, system specification, installation and training, to post-installation field services, the excellence of the Starrett line is matched by the quality and comprehensive range of their services. So for more information, visit online at www.starrett.com or call 978-249-3551. All right, well, that's going to do it for this segment. Um, we are going to actually now have an interview for you. Uh, really good segment coming up for you now. As many of you know, Manufacturing Day is produced by the National Association of Manufacturers with contributions and support from the Hollings Manufacturing Extension Partnership, or the MEP, which is a program within NIST. So on this day in particular, we're very pleased to steal a few moments with Carol Thomas. Literally who is the, steal them. Literally steal them. <laughs> uh, with Carol Thomas, who is the director of the MEP program. She joins us now via Skype. Ms. Thomas, thanks for, for joining us so much today. Oh, you're welcome. I hope you can hear me. I had to go to plan B because it, uh, I, I couldn't uh, do it from my car. So hopefully you can hear me well and, and not hear a lot of the background <laughs> noise here. Uh, no, I'm here great. in uh, sunny Phoenix, Arizona. So <laughs> that, That's right. I mean, uh, we, we should say that, that uh, we really wanted to get Carol on the show because she is the director of yep. the MEP, but she was obviously manufacturing day is a big day for <laughs> for the MEP and Carol is out and about and she's managed to uh, squirrel away some time for us <laughs> before she gets on a plane. So I believe she's yes. somewhere yes. in a car park somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> so. uh, yes, actually I'm in the, uh, the airport, the Phoenix airport right now. <laughs> uh, I'll explain later, but thanks Dirk. Uh, I really appreciate uh, you having me on uh, the show today. It's such an exciting day. I just came from the Arizona Chamber of Commerce's event um, on Manufacturing Day, and they had uh, almost 200 manufacturers wow. participating and enjoying and, and listening, um, you know, finding out about all of the, the things that are available. Well, well, Carol, let's start a little bit with some brief background uh, about how and why Manufacturing Day, Day came about. So maybe you can kind of run us through uh, how, uh, how we came to Manufacturing Day. Sure. Um, I actually remember in 2012 when we first heard about this, uh, the, a, a couple of groups, the Fabricators and Manufacturers Association International, contacted us and said, oh, would you like to participate in it? We thought it was great. For us, Manufacturing Day is every day. Um, but uh, back in 2012, the National Association of Manufacturers, um, we got involved and also the Fabricators and Manufacturers Association International uh, and the Manufacturing uh, Institute. Um, we were able to, uh, sorry about that, uh, work together Life to tell uh, <laughs> set up and, and get many manufacturers. I believe in that first year, we got about 400 manufacturers uh, available around the country. And originally it was set up to give people an idea of what's happening now in manufacturing. All of the great, exciting things in advanced manufacturing, it's not what you uh, thought, it's not dark and dirty anymore. Now it is high tech. Now it is um, 
a lot of it encompasses a lot of things that you hadn't thought about before additive manufacturing all the 3d printing things uh new lightweight materials it's it's just so exciting i, I can't begin to tell you how exciting it is well how, how do the various meps around the country help to facilitate and promote manufacturing day events well what we try to do is to get people to understand what is happening in manufacturing so the MEP uh, centers all around the country have open houses. They go to their clients, ask them if they're interested in setting up tours. Um, we uh, work with community colleges, local community colleges. We also work with uh, universities and associations uh, like chambers and, and various different local associations so that we can open up uh, manufacturing uh, plants so uh, we can attract students, their parents, uh, their their neighbors, everybody to find out what's happening in manufacturing now. And you know, those of us within the industry, I think, uh, know, we've come to realize, of course, that manufacturing in 2017 is an incredibly high-tech undertaking. But do you think that the general public still maybe thinks of it as a kind of a manual labor, dirt under the fingernails kind of business? Yes, and I wish they could come and see something like the Jelly Belly factory in Bakersfield, California where you go in and there's uh, 500 people working side by side with robots who actually wave at you when you go into a tour. And it is the most exciting thing now to go into plants. To me, they're destination uh, entertainment at this point because of all of the new types of manufacturing. You should see how, how food is made and, and, and um, other types of materials that uh, you've never seen before. There's a manufacturer in, um, not far from where I live that actually prints cars. Local motors will print a car mm -hmm. in 48 hours. And so those are the kinds of things that we'd like to get people excited about in terms of manufacturing today. Yeah, I mean, and, and let's, let's talk, let's change gears here a little bit. I mean, the, the Manufacturing Extension Partnership, the MEP, as we said, mm -hmm. is a program within NIST, which is a government program. So obviously it is paid for with taxpayer dollars. So what is the return that taxpayers are getting on their taxpayer dollars? Well, and as a taxpayer myself, uh, I am uh, very keen on what do you know? What do we do uh, as a program to really make the most of those tax tax dollars? And what we uh, we did a, a study with the Upjohn Institute, and the Upjohn Institute took our uh, impact numbers, and these are uh, third party survey numbers that we go out to our MEP centers and survey their clients six months to a year after they've been provided service to ask them, did it make a difference? Uh, what did you see in cost savings? Did it create new sales for you? Um, do you have new investments uh, in, in, you know, in growing your business? What, what's happening? So we have this uh, third party uh, that comes together and gets this information. And that information was what we gave to the Upjohn Institute. And the Upjohn uh, Institute used an economic model, uh, the Remy model, to look at uh, you know, what is the return on this investment. And what they came back with was absolutely astounding. They told us that the $130 million worth of funding that's provided on the federal side, which is matched uh, in the private, uh, either state funds or um, program income or, or some of theirs, but that $130 uh, million brought back nearly nine to one in return on that investment. So over a billion dollars in personal taxes of the people who work and get their salaries and pay the taxes come back into the coffers of this country because of uh, the impact that we've created. These are jobs uh, that are retained or created. Uh, these are new investments. All of this, almost nine to one for every one dollar, uh, nine dollars comes back in to, to take care of it. Um, also, they showed exactly, you know, how much it brings to the GDP, you know, what we did uh, in terms of our, our impacts um, bringing to the GDP, which is um, two and a half billion dollars. And so this, to me, really proves that we're not just providing, a, you know, going into a, a, a company and saying, here, do this, do this, but we go back to them afterwards. And what, what difference does it make? And then we measure that to see what it adds to the economy of this country. 
Wow. You know, uh, those of us here at Quality Advisors, I mean, we're all taxpayers too. Um, <laughs> and we're also, yes. of course, huge cheerleaders for, for U.S. manufacturing. We know that, of course, uh, we, we've seen some of the preliminary bu federal budgets uh, for the 2018 mm -hmm. year. And we know that the MEP program is, is, is certainly under threat. So what are you hearing and how can we maybe help support uh, the continued federal funding for the MEP program? Well, we I've been with the program uh, since 2000. And so uh, our, I would say, fault is we're not letting enough people know exactly what we do and the value of it. So my, uh, what I'm pushing as the director is to get out, reach more manufacturers, do more good, get more impacts. Because I believe that when manufacturers see, both big and small, but particularly small, see what we can do for them, uh, then I don't think we will have any problems at all uh, getting the funding that we need. Oh, that's awesome. Well, you know, we only have a few uh, few more minutes, but in that time, uh, can you just uh, fill us in a little bit on the initiatives that NIST and the MEP program are undertaking to support maybe the next generation of manufacturing professionals? Absolutely. Well, uh, in terms of the professionals, there's uh, many uh, apprenticeship programs that, that uh, in some of our MEP centers, they actually offer, but in uh, others, they make connections. Um, the one thing that I really would like for you to know about the MEP program is we actually are a part of the fabric of manufacturing in all 50 states of Puerto Rico. We don't just go in there and help the manufacturers, but we get involved with the other uh, programs, local and other national programs, that provide assistance uh, to businesses that can, um, particularly for manufacturing, uh, that include uh, environmental uh, sustainability, um, saving electricity, uh, energy, and different kinds of things. And so uh, what we see as a, a really important thing uh, in terms of initiative is a couple of things. We need to have that workforce, the workforce that knows how to uh, take advantage uh, and how um, to have the capabilities to work in advanced manufacturing. And we see two areas as being very, very important. Everything is going to uh, have to become digitalized. Everything will have to become digitalized because you're not going to be able to do the Internet of Things if you're not digital. And once uh, you have that or as part of planning to become digital, you must also be very careful, vigil, and understand the importance of cybersecurity. Those two things we feel are the foundations of what's going to happen. Uh, and so in terms of, of apprenticeships to help uh, get more people in uh, what's happening in manufacturing, we're looking at uh, programs with community colleges, with local associations, so that they prepare young people or people retiring or people interested in, in careers, not just jobs in manufacturing, but careers, long-term careers, that they understand digital manufacturing, that they understand how it is the platform for everything that's happening in in manufacturing and also the importance of good sound cybersecurity practices. You have to do both at the same time. You will never be able to really get into all of the very, very exciting things that's happening in manufacturing if you don't understand those two foundational parts of it. All right, well, Carol Thomas, Director of the Hollings Manufacturing Extension Partnership, thanks for taking the time this morning and parking your car and <laughs> finding a place to, <laughs> to Skype into us. We really appreciate you uh, kind of wedging us in. I'm very creative. <laughs> <laughs> you are creative. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Carol. Okay, thanks, we'll, Carol. We'll Thank see you, you soon. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dirk. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye. Bye. <laughs> All righty. People go to any length to that, be on this show. That's right. That's right. <laughs> they, 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 they do. Indeed, they do, Dirk. And that, yeah, again, that's Carol Thomas. She's with the, the Manufacturing Extension Partnership. She's the director of the Manufacturing Extension Partnership. Yeah, so exactly. It's yeah. always yeah. cool yeah. to have a director of a, of a program like that join us. Yeah. Um, you know, Dirk, we've got a little bit of time left on the show. So we wanted to, uh, to, to do our, our little roundtable wrap up here. Yeah. Uh, we have our, uh, our gathered team of application engineers joining us here uh, for the segment. Of course, we have uh, Raphael Hasman of, of Faro, and we have uh, Greg Mesh of Starrett back joining us. So thanks, guys, for, for sitting back in and, and talking to us a little bit about some, uh, some manufacturing issues. Yeah. We'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, just sure. a reminder, uh, anyone, uh, you can still squeeze in some questions. Yep. Uh, we've yep. got the uh, Ferro Quantum Arm guy here and the, uh, the Flip HVR100 guy over there. So if you still got questions on those, send them to us and, and we'll get to them. Uh, use QDL at qualitydigest.com. Tweet 
at Quality Digest or chat to us. Yeah, that's right. And uh, and of course, uh, Twitter, yes, at Quality Digest as well. Yep. Um, and yeah, if you have uh, any questions about you know their particular applications, it's fine. Mm -hmm. um, if you have general questions about manufacturing, we're sure. gonna kind of have a little round table here we'll about, about anything. some of the issues that, uh, that we think are, are going on in the world of manufacturing today on, on Manufacturing Day, so, uh, so we'll check right. that out. So, so what's, what's the first topic, Dirk, well, do you I, think? You know, I mean, we're seeing, I mean, you guys both work in the equipment field, so sure. uh, we're seeing more and more automation. Mm -hmm. right. uh, you know, uh, what, regardless, of, I mean, we looked at automation there for, uh, you know, uh, recognizing. Ferro has a lot of pr uh, automation in some of their products. Uh, right. Ferro makes more than just arms. If people aren't familiar with Ferro, mm -hmm. Ferro makes uh, what, laser trackers and laser yep. scanners and portable arms and Correct. Uh, all sorts of stuff. So uh, let, let's start with you, uh, Rafael. So where do you see, where do you see in your particular part of the industry, automation going in terms of in terms of test and test and measurement. What's what, what's kind of your your kind of the stuff maybe that's that maybe coming up through R and D that maybe you can't sure. tell us a whole lot about, but maybe just kind of give <laughs> us give us a flavor. Sure. Well, actually, Ferro has their Cobalt uh, 3D imaging system, okay. so that's uh, currently on the market and it's geared towards automation. Mm. So it's uh, it's a one head unit, but you can tie them together to get an array and get really wide field of views. So um, in some of our demos, we have uh, we're scanning the sides of doors, okay. um, scanning full full um, full bodies of cars. So where I see the future of automation going is just being able to scan your part compared to the CAD model, go no go, um, and then just optimizing that you know through software through implementation of robotics and uh, you know 3D imaging systems. Oh, so does the does the does the cobalt mount mount on an on a robot or is it, is it yeah. a, on, a, on a stand? So it can mount on a stand and uh, you can have uh, just a table, right, okay. rotating, okay. or you can mount it on a robot hmm. um, okay. and integrate that into your system. Yeah, I see a lot more of that. I see a lot yeah. more equipment being mounted on robots and the robot's yep. kind of just moving it around mm -hmm. and, yep. and then the, the smart stuff's on the, on the actuator. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. yeah. So uh, we use the robot kind of like an arm, right? Yeah. And um, we're controlling the robot and telling it where to go and then our, our cobalt scanners was capturing the data there and comparing that to the CAD model. Mm -hmm. Okay, and what we're seeing, obviously we saw some automation with, uh, uh, mm -hmm. with, with the flip uh, in terms of software automation, but right. uh, w what else is going on? Well, we, we haven't ever done this, but we would like to be able to basically get you know, a robot arm that can grab parts and place them right mm -hmm. onto the machine, because that would be. Uh, that's what I was thinking when yeah. we were talking earlier about the, the, the automate about, about automatically recognizing a part. If you could just keep feeding that that flip, I mean, that would be pretty awesome. Oh yeah, right. Because then you could have yeah. a lights out thing, just have it yeah. be reading parts all night long. Um, yeah, the the our software guys, they they also make our hardware for our boards. They do have some I/O to do that, and we right. know of some other people who've used their software that have done it. They have a little bit more programming resources than we do, so we'd have to probably, you know, we're going to look into trying to do something there, yeah. um, you know, because then you could get into a cell in a manufacturing area and just have that be part of the process mm -hmm. automatically. Um, you know, that's probably not anything anytime in the near future, but it's right. certainly something that I think we need to look at doing for sure. So how does how does Steret how does Steret get the information from their customers in terms of what what features they would like to see in existing equipment or upcoming mm -hmm. equipment and does does Starrett go out and, and kind of solicit uh, th those questions from their their customers or your, are your customers just constantly giving feedback boy I wish you, you, you it would do this I wish it would do that oh, there's a little bit of both for sure um, I think our sales guys also they know of needs a lot of times of what customers are looking for because you know they may they may lose a sale over a feature that we don't have yet right. and then a lot of times if it turns out that that's a trend we'll say well why isn't this a feature? Mm -hmm. And then oftentimes that's how we implement new things. Um, or a lot of times if I get, because you know, I'll get an application study where they want to measure a challenging part and that might guide a new lighting system, mm -hmm. for instance. Okay. Um, yeah, we, we recently designed a new dome light that has stepped angles on it um, to get inside internal threads on it. It was basically like an eyedropper cap. So, you know, that it's kind cool. of specific, but yeah. it, that, that light can be useful in, in a bunch of other applications that we've had a couple of orders for them um, so far. That's pretty much a brand new thing as well. But so, you know, either features that we don't have that customers would like to see or just applications that we get asked, hey, can you measure our part? Mm -hmm. that's, that's done a fair amount of guiding as far as new developments are concerned. Right. Well, you know, you can't, you can't really talk about automation, machine intelligence without 
uh, immediately thinking, of course, about employment and about mm -hmm. what that does to affect uh, the future of the industry in terms of people coming into the industry that would have jobs. Um, so, Raphael, what are you seeing in terms of, for instance, how, I mean, both you guys are pretty young, mm -hmm. you're pretty, pretty sure. fairly new in the, in the field, so what are you seeing in terms of how we are bringing people successfully, or, or maybe there's roadblocks, to bringing people into the field and letting them know about the opportunities and test and measurement? Um, it, with automation, it, it is kind of, it's a touchy subject, right? Mm -hmm. well, how are we going to replenish those jobs? Right. Um, I think I heard Elon Musk was suggesting some kind of universal pay scheme. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. a few people everyone, have done that. Yep, yeah, yep. Where everyone gets paid, uh, you know, yeah. a certain amount. But base pay, yeah. that, that's probably thinking, you know, way down the line. Mm -hmm. um, but what I think is important is just stressing, um, basically teaching people how to use this equipment, very similar to um, our friend that, that gave us a a view of his shop and how he, oh, he right, mentioned right. Yeah, that yeah. we don't we don't replace our, our employees we teach them how to use the new That's equipment right, right? right. which mm -hmm. is uh, can be maybe difficult with the older generation but yeah. um, it's all about st staying one step ahead and, and learning especially when you're in college learning mm -hmm. what where the industry is going instead of where it is now mm -hmm. it's important to look forward yeah and I, I think I think uh, Greg you had mentioned that uh, one of the things that Starrett is doing is I think you said like a, a college internship mm -hmm. program and that sort of thing to kind of bring people into the fold sort of yeah, that was something that we at uh, Sterrett Kinometric at our location are looking to do specifically. Um, one of one of my colleagues there, he's a uh, adjunct professor at UCI, and he um, he's looking to get some some interns to help us with you know calibration and possibly even some drafting if for the engineering department kind of thing. Uh, and that's I think that's a, I, I really like that because I, you know I got some good experience doing a similar thing when I was uh, when I was in college. And that really led me to the job that I'm at mm -hmm. now. Um, I think that that gives people a good idea of you know what to expect in a certain industry, so they're not just jumping into something that they may or may not be suited for. Right, right. Um, and then it gives us the opportunity to maybe get some of these guys, you know, fresh out of college. If if they if they're a good fit, then we ha you know we sort of have our foot in the door for getting sure. them to help mm -hmm. us. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, I you know. I'd like to see that happen very, very soon. Uh, I think I think I saw a question come in. Mm. Do we mm -hmm. have one? Great. Yep. Oh. Oh, any thought on automation? <laughs> well, okay. yeah, yeah, automate. Big word. Uh, any thoughts on automation being more than yeah. just robots? Oh man, I think we could all talk about that. Yeah, but, uh, yeah I can tackle that. <laughs> sure. from, uh, just from my perspective, I'm an applications engineer with Ferro Rights. So my job is to go out and train people on how to use our equipment. So uh, one of the things we've been discussing is developing a database of videos, for example. Mm. Instead of spending the first half of a day, you know, teaching people how to set up, how to calibrate, let's automate that. Let's show them a video before I even come on site. So I just show up everything set up yep. and we get right into the issues of teaching them how to use the equipment. So that's a form of automation in itself, yeah, right? Yeah. We're, we're automizing our our teaching process, right? So that's, uh, in every field, there's there's automation right. going on, I think. Well, and, and even we're talking, again, just to go back to the, the demo mm -hmm. we saw, I mean, that wasn't robotics, that was just, that was pattern recognition. Mm -hmm. I mean, that yep. was recognizing what's on there. That's automation. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, even I mean, even if you want to be a little bit broader, you know, the the Internet of Things, right? Just connected bits. So the ability of your equipment, you know, whether it's Starrett's equipment or mm -hmm. Ferrell's equipment, the ability for it to communicate its results to you know back to the factory, for instance, sure. for for tracking, you know, how's a, I, I know some companies are doing that. Is how you know how's this equipment doing out in the field? Giving maybe the company early notice that hey, you know, this uh, this piece of equipment seems to keep throwing up this error, and rather than waiting for the 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 user, mm. the end user, to call you and say, hey, we have a problem with this equipment, you've known about it for you know maybe a few days and are already working on it, and right. that's a form of automation. Definitely. Mm -hmm. yeah. We have another question, Chris? We just Thoughts on automation and supply chain management. Wow, well, you know, um, boy, that's another, you guys are asking well, some big questions. Well, again, I mean, <laughs> uh, this is something, I mean, you guys can feel free to jump in on this, but a lot of supply chain management is also being automated. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, we talk about various, there's various software companies that we work with sure. where the, the, the different members of the supply chain are required to have, you know, feed all their reports, all their daily numbers, uh, sometimes even real-time numbers mm -hmm. into their software, the software that runs on their platform, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, runs at their company, and that's connecting with their person that they're supplying to, sure, sure. giving that company constant feedback on, okay, how's, how's this supplier doing, how's this supplier doing, so that the whole supply chain can be kind of automatically 
massaged as 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 things go well, and that, go on. And that ties in with another big picture item we talk about all the time here, which is risk management. I mean, you know, sure. understanding what your suppliers are doing and and what where maybe they're having problems before those problems become apparent. Right. If you can track them further up upstream, you're going to have a better chance of avoiding the potential critical failure down the line somewhere. So these are right. these are these are items that really affect a lot of what all of our, our viewers out there are doing for, for a living, I think. Yep. Mm -hmm. Was that, a, that was the think, same question? I think, yeah. Oh, no. You take a note? Well, you know, let, yeah, you guys, this is just great. Uh, any questions with training, any concerns with training millennials awesome. for manufacturing sustainability with massive retirements of the baby boomers? Well, Greg, why, why, don't you, why don't you jump on that one? That's, I guess, a really good question. What do you, um, what do you think about that? Let's see. Well, the, the issues with, with tra training folks to to basically right. be able to walk in and be operational well, in, in the short term. You know, yeah. you talked about this actually a little bit, you touched on this actually a little bit earlier when I asked mm -hmm. you the question about walking into a shop right. with this newfangled piece of equipment and you got the old timers using the shadow graph. Yeah. Right, I right. mean, that's kind of that whole issue right there. Yeah, yeah, well, I think the sustainability for those, for those industries is really going to be, you know, how do we because you're still going to need obviously people there for jobs it's not going to be fully automated anytime right. soon it's going that direction but for now you need people to be using that technology in a in a useful way i think um i think that being able to get the basically the the people coming in and replacing those uh to be able to leverage the newer things as soon as they get there that that's actually going to drive progress i believe um and they're gonna they're gonna have to be more technical, mm -hmm. I believe, than their than the previous generation. Just and, and they basically are. I mean, yeah, and yeah. they are. I'm, you know, just myself. I grew up using a computer since I was seven years old, <laughs> and I know that just having done that, it's kind of like language. Where when you're learning that yeah. stuff at such a young age, it's intuitive for me in a way that it's just not for my dad. Yeah. You know, like for right. him, he's got to learn it in a much more traditional kind of sense, whereas for me it's like, oh, I kind of know yeah, where this be, should be. You've been exposed to it since you were a kid, yeah. Exactly, yeah, and yeah. it's going to just become more and more that way. Um, yeah, and I think that, you know, another advancement that we haven't really talked about at all, but that isn't robotics, is, you know, machine learning. I think that mm -hmm. computers are going to mm -hmm. learn where these problems exist faster than we can pretty quickly. Yep, and right. uh, you, But you're still going to need humans to have to analyze and evaluate how to use that data in a way that's that's useful. So it'll be. I think we're in a very interesting, uh, the most interesting time right. ever in that in that sense. Yeah. So. A machine. What What are your thoughts on on machine learning? Where, where, where computers are teaching themselves. Right. Yeah, it's it's a uh, very rapidly you know evolving field. Yeah. I think uh, what was it? Uh, Google's uh, assistant just wrote its own paragraph and <laughs> created its own <laughs> right. song. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. In the future, yeah. we're just going to go see a computer screen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this yeah. is really yeah. created. Right. We, um, all, all of our work is going to be done for us. And we'll yeah. Just sit around. Great. Yeah. <laughs> just sit back, sit back and enjoy as everything gets yeah. taken care of. Collect e Elon Musk base, base pay. Yeah. yeah. There you go. Uh, All right. Do, oh, we had another question. All right. Oh. oh, thoughts about online self-paced training for factory technicians. Hmm. Uh, actually, you. I think you kind of touched on that right. with the, with the uh, explain that again. Yeah. So Faro is coming out with the Faro Academy for uh, a wide range of its products where. Um, we're going to have videos that mm -hmm. are interactive and that you can watch at your own pace where you can learn how to calibrate your equipment, learn how to do very basic uh, inspection processes. Um, and then as, as that grows and, and we get more users adopting and maybe asking questions for specific workflows, um, let's say, oh, we need to measure uh, turbine blades. How, you know, what's the best way to do that? Maybe we can create a video specifically for mm -hmm. that task. So um, I think that also kind of addresses uh, the issue with millennials, right? Millennials, every, you know, now mm -hmm. they're on YouTube, they're on Instagram. Maybe it's a matter of providing the right content that they're comfortable seeing and uh, using that to train millennials mm -hmm. um, as well as your current employees, right? Mm -hmm, right? Optimizing that to have an effective um, product and, and show people how to use equipment. Mm -hmm. I think right. it's a very versatile, very versatile time. No doubt. Yeah, interesting. Uh, oh. Well, that's uh, it for that a round it. table. That was, that was, that was wow. it for our questions. Nice. Great <laughs> stuff. And, hey, you know, and the timing's perfect. You know, and hey, everybody, uh, sure, certainly continue to send us questions. If you do have more questions, uh, uh, qdlquality.com, uh, we'd love to get them, and we'll, we'll send them out to the appropriate uh, application engineers and experts to have your, have your question answered for you. 
Well, that's our show. Many thanks once more to our sponsors of today's virtual test and measurement expo, the Ella Starry Company and Ferrer Technologies. Thanks guys for doing that. Represented, of course, by application engineers, Eric Perkins, who was with us earlier today, Greg Mache to my left, uh, Raphael Hasman to my right. Uh, Mike Kosky is not here, but Mike was on the video that you saw earlier today as well. And also, Neil, we really appreciate the, the time, energy, and expert insights on manufacturing from Gordon Stiles of Star Rapid. And special thanks to Robert Green and the team over at Transfer Flow, just down the street from That's us, right. for opening their doors to us and, of course, opening their doors to the public and how important that is. Yep. And, of course, a special shout out to Carol Thomas, director of the MEP, from, from literally wedging us in in between flights. She's probably <laughs> going through the gate right now. <laughs> exactly. She's like, I'm on my plane. And most All importantly, right. of course, thank Thanks so much to all of you, our viewers, for checking out the show and contributing so many great questions. A lot of great questions from you all, really. As always, you guys are the, are the best thing about what we do is, is our, our user group, so thank you for doing that. But we know the real reason you showed up. No. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we do have the winners selected of, um, of, of our drawing. Ran, those, ran, those, randomly, yep. randomly selected three people to win uh, our three gifts. Yep, yep. And uh, let's read them off here. That's right. Okay. So for the Sterrett tool bag, that is Noble or Nobel. Noble Noble Chan, Chan is the winner. And we have an Amazon gift card uh, that was from Faro. That's uh, Jerry Bowlerjack is the winner of that. And the Amazon gift card uh, also uh, from, from us, from, uh, from, from, from us, from Quality yep. Digest is Thomas Schulte. So we will be sending you guys an email. You know we have your email. That's right. And uh, we will be sending that. Uh, information to you on how to collect your, on uh, how we're going to send you yep. your prize. You'll send us your address and so forth, and we'll get that all scored away. Good so, idea. once again, thanks to everybody for joining us. Uh, thanks to our winners. I'm sure they appreciated That's hanging right. around. And uh, we will hopefully do one of these again. We will. We'll, pretty, we'll, we'll, do, we'll, awesome. we'll do more of these. Next week, of course, we're back at you with a regular episode of, of Quality Digest Live. But uh, yeah, keep your, keep your eyes peeled. We'll be doing a show like this again coming up in the future. And just to address that question that we did get, yes, this is all recorded. Mm -hmm. This entire episode would be on YouTube and most likely individual segments yeah. will be on uh, certainly the tech corner the the technical segments that you saw those individual video clips uh, of those demos those for certain will be on YouTube so um, if you haven't subscribed to our YouTube channel you should YouTube. do that it's YouTube YouTube that's right <laughs> quality <laughs> on YouTube there it goes all right well thanks everybody for joining us again you all have a great weekend we'll see you next week so long bye